Hi, Jeff. Can you hear me? Oh, I'll call you right now.
Richard, if you're connected, I did send you a text message regarding the agenda for tonight. Okay, won't let me come onto the picture. There we go. We're all here. We're waiting just a moment for Jeff. Oh, I thought he's right there. He's connecting to audio from my view. You guys able to hear me all right? I yeah. do. Very good. I got a new microphone. Oh, good. Excellent. You get a Game Boy to go with it? <laughs> <laughs> there was something about that, but I did that's I didn't go that route. There he is. Okay. Um, if you wait just a moment, I'm still showing him having some audio oh, issues. Okay, all right. Um, and Alicia, um, if you might want to call Jeff on his cell and see if you can help him resolve that. Hi, Rebecca. We're on the phone right now, and it seems like his video is connected, but uh, the audio is having trouble connecting. Dennis, did you sell him your old microphone? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And Alicia, do you have any suggestions for things he can try? We, um, he's going to try it again right now to rejoin the meeting. Okay. Buy a new computer. That uh, reconnecting thing worked for me last time. Look at all those smiling faces looking at us down here. <laughs> <clears throat> we got a full house sitting on this thing. Nice. Wow, two pages worth. Didn't seem that exciting to me. 
Well, you see all the names, Vice Chair Mazza. There's a lot of them. Well, I know, and some pros. So we will see. <clears throat> Both can't work. I guess we'll just drink here. We can try his phone. Single malt. Yeah, Canada Dry Single Malt. I'm pretty hardcore with the Diet A&W root beer myself. Oh, <laughs> get yourself some ice cream. <laughs> I know. I did have ice cream tonight after dinner. It was nice. Rare moment. Well, Rebecca at, uh, at Ralph's, they have um, ice cream bars that are... Uh, Root beer floats, real good. Interesting. Oh, yeah. I might have to look into that. Signature brand. They also have 50-50. Oh, same thing. You never go wrong with the 50-50. You know? Okay, I see Jeff, it appears connected to audio. Um, Alicia, can you make sure he's unmuted? And Jeff, do you want to give a shot saying something? It says the host is not allowing participants to unmute themselves. Oh, well, I'm hearing you, so that's encouraging. If you want to hear everybody, it sounds like you might be hearing him over the phone. I'm, I'm on the phone. I mean, oh. he's he's in the meeting. Well, we can hear you. I, I can't start the video because when I try, no. it's oh, there, you go. there you are. There you are. Okay, okay then I think so we're I ready think... to go. We're ready. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Hey, I mean, well, good evening, friends and neighbors. I would like to call to order the Malibu Planning Commission regular meeting of the date of October 17, 2022. Happy birthday, Caroline. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to COVID 19 pandemic. Commissioners and city staff are participating in this Zoom meeting from remote locations. All votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org slash virtual meeting. At that screen, click on one of two tabs to either watch or sign up to speak on particular items. Those wishing to speak must present in the Zoom meeting, must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Please sign up before the item has been called by the chair. Those wishing to defer time to someone else intending to speak are not required to sign up, but must be present in the meeting. If instead of speaking, you wish to donate your time to another speaker, please click the, click the raise hand button at the bottom of the Zoom screen when the public hearing item is open. A speaker may accept up to five additional minutes, one minute each from each speaker that defers time for a maximum total of eight minutes. And since we don't have Alex tonight, we have who, Rebecca? I'm sorry. Alicia will be working with us this evening. Okay. Um, she's supposed to show the slide of the raised hand, I believe. There it is. So commissioners, when you have comments, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our decision clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call Please. Commissioner Hill. Here. Commissioner Jennings. Here. Commissioner Wetton. Here. Vice Chair Mazza. Here. Chair Smith. Here. You have a quorum. Wonderful. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda as staff recommends with items 5A continued to December 5th, 1922, uh, 2022, and 5B to November 7th, 2022. And before that seconded, um, I believe Richard wanted to ask for an adjustment as well. Yes, Chair. Um, the staff member that was going to present item 7A is the staff member who's actually been working on a lot of those implementation members. She had a family emergency and was unable to work with us today. Uh, 
I do know, Rebecca, confirm if you could please. Uh, I do believe there are folks that are signed up to speak on that item. Yes. Um, and Pat, should we let those folks speak or just continue everything to uh, the next available meeting? Correct. It really is up to the discretion of the chair. Um, we can continue that item. They can, of course, speak during general public comment. Or when you get to that item, chair, if you would like to only open it up for public comment, that's also your prerogative. It's not a public hearing. There's no real due process concerns or anything, anything like that. All right, Chair Smith. Yeah, go ahead, Vice Chair. Uh, I would suggest we just continue the item. Uh, either that or when we have the next meeting, we'll have to play their their um, comments because the general public will not be listening to the staff report tonight, and I'm sure other people may may want to that haven't raised their hand. Well, I I I'll be honest. I kind of feel the same way. I I know that um, Dire Director Malik has worked on this, and he's had someone else obviously working with him, and it's pretty important. I think he wants to get the point out there, and I think by having all the parties necessary to do that, um, I think that'll I think it's a better deal. I that's what I, I I'm okay with that. Continuing, Director Malik, do you have a date you were thinking you about? Rebecca, do you have the date we discussed? I'm sorry, I don't have it written down. I would suggest November 21st, simply because the next meeting has a pretty full agenda. Okay, I'll amend my uh, motion to include, was it 7A or 7? 7A. 7A to November 21st, 2022. And do I have a second? A second. Thank you. Okay. And would you like me to call the roll? Yes. Um, Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Wetton? Yes. Chair Smith? Yes. Motion carries. That probably means we're going to lose half those people I'm looking at on the screen. Um, okay. Um, approval of the agenda, report on report. Uh, posting of the agenda, recording Secretary Evans. The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on October 7th, 2022. And I don't think we have any um, ceremonial presentations at this time. Um, written and oral communications from the public. Uh, do, do we have any speakers? I'm refreshing. At this point, no one has signed up to speak under item 2A. If there are members of the public who would like to speak on matters not on tonight's agenda, you may click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. And seeing none. I'm seeing none. Okay, taking it away from uh, public comment and onto the table here with our commissioners. Uh, anybody have any? Wow. Oh, there we go. There we go. I just want to encourage everybody who's a Malibu citizen to vote in the upcoming election. It's a non-presidential year and voting will be light and you should participate in the city. So talk to the people running and vote for whoever you think is best. Very good. Commissioner Hill. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first off, let me just say, if I seem more grouchy or uh, more uh, nonlinear than usual, it's because I have a back spasm right now, so I'm, uh, I have a little bit of distraction, and I'm kind of power trying to power through it. Um, two comments. Well, maybe three. Um, first, about a week ago, I saw about 10 campers at Tuna Beach in the evening, um, so that seems like an enforcement thing that Maybe it was just a, a one-off, an unusual thing, but it wasn't getting enforced that night. And then relatedly, another sort of sheriff-related issue. Uh, a couple times lately, I've seen trucks unloading from the center lane, especially in the commercial zone um, around Nobu and, and between there and the pier, roughly. And I talked to a sheriff about it, and I just said, you know, what? I see this a lot, these trucks just parked there and doing their deliveries and so forth. And he just kind of said, yeah, like 
yeah, we just, that, yeah, it's a drag, but we just let it happen because what are we going to do? I mean, that was the attitude. So I, I don't understand that because those lanes are, are traffic. Um, they'll have, they have traffic in them, and that's where we have a lot of pedestrian problems. So I don't know what we have to do, but I just thought I'd call that out publicly. And then finally, I'm wondering if staff, Richard, could provide us a preview for us and the public of a couple of upcoming items and just let us know where they're at. One of them being the um, revetment at near Big Rock where Caltrans is having to fix up that whole uh, steep thing. And I thought that was coming to us soon and then it disappeared. And then the other one is, what's the deal at Topanga? There's that long linear parcel that I think was on our agenda and that got continued too. Um, those are, I think, two matters of big public in, interest, and it would be good to know where they're at right now, if you know. Thank you. Go ahead, Director Malika. Oh, very good. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Am I not? Oh, sorry. Am I, I not being seen here? It's hard to see <laughs> that hand because oh. you have all the light there in the back. Very sorry. Very I thought long. Richard would be okay. answering me, but I guess it can wait. All right. Go ahead, Commissioner Jennings. Okay, I have a couple of comments. Uh, one last meeting, uh, I asked about uh, for a, a brief explanation of the temporary use permit uh, issue with regard to the uh, Malibu Film Society. And I think, uh, Richard, at that time you said, well, there's going to be an Oasis meeting uh, next week, uh, which I was not able to attend or, or witness. And so maybe in your comments, you can give us a little summary of uh, what happened in that regard at the Zoracis meeting, if anything. Um, my second question is that, I, although I did not attend, that there was that meeting at, uh, at Elkins Hall at Pepperdine last week. Uh, and um, basically all I know about it is what Hans Letts wrote in his, in his newsletter. But there was apparently some concern about uh, policies uh, just the practical implementation policies that the staff uses to, to apply to projects that were being changed. And I'd like to have some explanation of uh, exactly what the process is by which policies could be changed. And just editorially, one of the things that I've been strongest about over the years is making sure that our policies are predictable and certain and uh, if there are going to be policies, I don't know where these policies are being written or how they're being recorded. They don't seem to be in our policy book uh, that we have for the LIP. And uh, uh, my point is, I guess, that if the policies are going to be changed, they shouldn't be changed without notice to the public at large so that people won't spend uh, ridiculous amounts of money designing projects that then have to be redesigned. And secondly, they, if they're going to be making changes, the changes should be prospective. They shouldn't apply to projects that uh, have already been deemed complete, just as changes in the law uh, don't apply to projects that have been deemed complete. So um, those are my comments and slash questions. Um, just a quick comment on that. Um, Yesterday, I tried to find the policy manual <clears throat> to check on a policy, and you can find it if you know what you're doing and you spend some time sorting around the website, but it's an important thing. We used to update it all the time and have meetings about it, and, and so I would ask that it be put on the front page of the planning, a link be put on the front page of the planning uh, department website so people can find it. It uh, explains a lot of things that we have to go over and over and over again in our meetings. Thank you. Very good. Commissioner Wetton? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I've got a comment on the uh, the Tankus Country Mart project as it relates to the uh, MTA bus flow through there. When, when that a project was approved, uh, they were allowed to turn around the buses in the parking lot that's uh, west of Trancas. And it, it, we fought it uh, pretty hard because it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a nuisance. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a hazard. Uh, they ended up prevailing and that was the way it went. We, you know, they were allowed to uh, 
to turn around in that parking lot and, and use Trancus as a stop there for the end of the end of the line. The problem now is that the buses are stopping on the east side of Trancus as they come up. It's it's painted red as a fire lane. And I, I, I brought this up to uh, Public Safety Commission and a couple of different times. And they, you know, it's said that they've uh, uh, made comments about it and tried to do something. I just don't know if there's anything that we can do from the planning department side, you know, to kind of go back and revisit that. It's the problem is, is that when those buses are parked on the east side um, and people are walking up the street, you got to go around either, you know, through the planter on the on the east side or in the middle of the street on the west side of the bus. I mean, they're big, right? There are uh, there's ample parking for those buses on the west side of the street, which is where they're supposed to be. Anyway, long story short, I just wonder if there's anything on our side that we can do to, um, you know, enforce that, you know, fire lane parking. Okay, good stuff. Um, and, and I see it, I, I too see what you're, obviously I see that, so. Um, okay, um, I'll go ahead and then I'll let Director Malika uh, answer a couple of the questions you guys had, or do you wanna go first? Director Malika, do you wanna go? Uh, certainly, I'll be glad to answer the questions there. Okay. Um, I will, so to Commissioner Hill's points, um, we did bring up, and I'll follow up again in our, uh, and it's great you guys tell me this on Monday night, because Tuesday we have our director's meeting and the sheriff uh, typically attends, the captain and one of the lieutenants, they typically attend our meeting, uh, our director's meeting. So I'll follow up with them on the center lane issue. Uh, we, our public works director did bring that up with the captain in terms of both unloading and we've also the report, I believe it came from this commission, if I'm not mistaken, of folks, uh, delivery guys parking in the center lane and then running into Jack in a Box or McDonald's to get lunch. I think that might've come from here. So we did forward that to them. Um, I will follow up again tomorrow with Rob so that we bring it up again to and it seemed that the captain was interested in that. I know that when she last had worked out here, um, she had focused heavily on that in front of McDonald's. So I will bring that up again. And then also I'll bring up the issue of the, the campers at Tuna Beach, because I do know that the sheriff has been enforcing our oversized vehicle ordinance. So I'll be sure to pass along both of those. And just to clarify, um... I just spoke to a deputy, so he, he was not in the loop on any, you know, policy or anything. And I also wonder what, whether there's a code enforcement component to that center lane parking, if if there's anything about deliveries or anything like that that would be within the city's jurisdiction. There would be if it's spelled out in the conditional use permit. If I'm trying to think if we did that for Tranca's Market, for example, but um, if we spell it out in the CEP, then yes, there's an enforcement issue. Um, I think in the case of Nobu and Soho, it, it's more of a traffic uh, issue uh, to be enforced by the sheriff's department, but I, I don't mind looking into that. And then at your next meeting, at the presently we have the revetment next, uh, I believe it's the one you're talking about, the Caltrans project. We have that scheduled for the next uh, planning commission meeting. I'm sorry, I don't know about the long parcel at Trancus. No, at, 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 at Topanga. Yeah. Um, I know that the at the request of the applicant, we continued the, the project there that's on the east side of Tuna Canyon, north of PCH there and Topanga. I know that We've been sitting in on the Topanga Lagoon restoration projects. Um, but other than that, I'm not too certain of any other projects, but I'd be glad to follow up with you on that. Well, I feel like we got a uh, project on our agenda that was continued that was, I looked it up on a map and it was a long, narrow parcel. And I, I thought it was associated with the restoration project, but it wasn't very specific. It was. It was the state, it was either Caltrans or Parks, I forget. Um, but 
That, didn't that show up on our agenda <laughs> once it's continued? Oh, Rebecca, looks like you have something to add. Well, I was just going to say that I think you might be thinking of 19768 PCH. I don't really know what that parcel is shaped like, but that is the only continued Caltrans project that we've had. Uh, I'm not sure what that's the one that Richard just mentioned, right? I think yeah. that's the yeah. And then we did have one other one that was brought to the commission and you asked for it to come back at a later date. That's as a, a different commission. one too. Yeah. So okay, I guess I must that's have, all we've got so far. Must have been hallucinating then. <sighs> um I believe we just got a notice on the property Dennis graded years ago at Tuna and uh, PCH, which may be what you're looking at because it it's big, but it's long. And I believe we just got a card on it yesterday, uh, a notice card. So uh, it, it, it's actually correct. Rebecca, isn't that one of the items we continue tonight, if I'm not mistaken? To December 5th. Right. Yeah, I believe that is. Yeah, and that's not the one I saw. It, it, if you that's can, not you can we don't need to we don't need to belabor this. Okay. Um, um, oh, uh, chair, if I may. Uh, sorry. Um, to Commissioner Jennings' point, the the two items that were brought up at that event by Schmitz and Associates were the uh, the claims that we had changed our policy on demolitions, and also the claim that we had changed our policy on swimming pools. Uh, with demolition, actually, the printed version of that is that no demolition shall be allowed to happen over the counter. Uh, Bonnie, as an, in an effort to be reasonable, allowed for a, a director's discretion up to 5%. Uh, for some reason, Smits and Associates believes that it was 10%. Uh, it hasn't been. And uh, I've stayed consistent with Bonnie's policy of 5%. I have actually allowed in one case, something to be a little bit larger, upwards of maybe 7%. Uh, but in general, we've stuck with that. And then there was also the concern of swimming pools. And the issue that we run into there is that while the city's zoning code is silent on how you look at swimming pools versus impermeable or, or permeable surfaces, according to our public works director, uh, their guidelines have always stated that swimming pools are considered to be impermeable surfaces. Richard, let me let me stop you because I am not at all interested in the substance of the dispute or the the, the items that the the, the, the the specifics of the items. What I'm concerned about is the process. If you're if you're telling me as you, as you sort of sound like you're saying that you're really not changing any policies and that these people are mistaken when they say that policies have been changed, okay, if, if, if that's not what you're telling me and that there has been changes made to the, to the procedures, like for example, one of them I think that Schmitz mentioned was that uh, uh, remodels up to a certain percentage could be treated as uh, administrative uh, 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 CDPs and not full CDPs and that had somehow been changed to, a, to change the percentage. So, but without regard to the substance of any of them, is there a procedure in place or have, if changes are made in policies, how are those changes made and, and who makes them and where are they recorded and how does the public get to know about it and what do you do to mitigate the problems that even small changes can make in, in the cost of putting the project together? Certainly. So our policy is, unless there's something extremely minor and I, I haven't made any, Demolition, for example, was one of them that Bonnie did. Uh, that that one did not go to Zoe races. Uh, Adrian and I actually have a list of items we'd like to take before Zoe races uh, to make certain that we vet the policy before implementing it. Uh, so that is how I'd like to keep things moving forward: is that they go to Zoe races, and the city's practice, and I think that uh, Pat would back me up on this, is that if the policy changes and the project's been deemed complete, our practice has been to honor the, the practice at the time that it was deemed complete. Uh, that's what we did for with basements, for example. We usually will issue a letter 
advising the applicant that the code is changing, but assuring them that because their application was deemed complete prior to the change in the interpretation or policy, um, that they that the codes that the how it was deemed complete will be how we move forward. Um, and so, yes, we use the interpretations manual. I completely agree with Commissioner or Vice Chair Maza. Uh, that manual needs, I think there's a lot of things on our website that need to be revamped. Uh, it's a matter of staffing. We will get there to make that more obvious. Uh, code enforcement was my last concern. I wanted to make sure that one was very obvious for people. Um, so we got that, but um, I do think one that we can make that interpretation and policies manual a lot more uh, visible. And then my plan is to continue to take things to zone races. If someone feels that something's been changed, I'll be glad to look into it to make sure that uh, a staff member is not making an interpretation without discussing it with us. Because it could also just be we have a lot of new staff and perhaps an error. We are we are trying to make sure that everyone's trained. Okay, well that's that's all that's good news. Have you got anything for me on the uh, temporary use permit issue that was raised at Zoasis? Uh, we and I was going to bring that up under my comments. Yes, so uh, at oh, Zoasis last week, uh, no, no, no worries. At Zoasis last week, we we held a meeting uh, to talk about the temporary use uh, permits and the processing of those. We did get direction from the Zoasis subcommittee. Uh, to bring an item to this commission. So my consultant uh, is working on that. It's uh, some of you might remember Joseph Smith. Uh, Joseph is uh, under is a consultant for us under contract. He is working on a draft in the proposal on that. Uh, just kind of a sneak peek, I guess you could say for the commission. What you'll be seeing is a proposal whereby events that are in some of our parks like Bluffs Park, Legacy Park, that are community events, arts, cultural events, small in nature. Um, those events will be uh, the proposals to allow, given they're a certain size and fall during certain hours, uh, those events could happen in the public parks without the need for a temporary use permit. Uh, larger scale events or events that have amplified music, commercial in nature uh, will it looks like the proposal on that based off the recommendations from Zoe races and comments would be to have those through a TUP process. We also will be looking at a potential for a, a TUP that would be a, like a major TUP, if you will, that will be presented to the planning commission. And that could be for um, events that are gonna happen on a more regular basis, say during the summer. Uh, but something like that, because of potential impacts, we'll, we'll bring back uh, to the Planning Commission. The Malibu Film Society was discussed, um, and it, it, if anybody watches the, the meeting, they'll see, I don't think it's a surprise, it was a contentious issue uh, because of the concern, uh, for example, at the Presbyterian Church, or the old Presbyterian Church. The concerns is that when the, you know, there's a, a good amount of traffic impacts there. And I'm not quite certain that uh, everything was fully fleshed out. I think the Film Society uh, explained that they were a, a smaller venue, not something over 100 people. It was a smaller event. Uh, the only concern, and I think it's fair to say from a staff perspective, is that we acknowledge that that center has been operating without a conditional use permit. Uh, the concern would be that hosting an event other than a church event would be an intensification or something outside the past history of we're aware of, of what that venue had been hosting. Um, but the film society was discussed. And if it is this commission's pleasure, I'd be glad to bring back an item explaining, you know, like I think it would be picking up where it left off with the film, uh, excuse me, the Malibu Jewish Center project up until now uh, to explain uh, what we've done, because we've actually spent a lot of time uh, researching past council agendas, uh, past minutes, past resolutions, trying to find something in there where the council said they could operate uh, without the benefit of a TUP, and we have been unable to find anything to that effect. We found where the, the, the council uh, 
encouraged a film society, I think is a fair word. They looked at partnering, um, but I couldn't find anything or my staff couldn't find anything on the permitting process. Um, and I know that they've stated that the previous um, city management said they could just operate. Uh, I, I haven't spoken with the city manager, former city manager, but I spoke with the former planning director at the time, and she was not able to support that. She explained that, no, they would have needed a permit like anyone else. So it, it did come up. It was a contentious item, uh, but I'd be more than glad if, if it's the commission's will to present more on that. And then uh, Commissioner Wetton. Uh, I will talk with Rob DeBow tomorrow, our public works director, about the buses. That is a city street. Perhaps something, uh, I don't know if it's possible, but I think if it is a fire lane, uh, then, and, I, and I'm and i sorry, I forget, what, I remember working on that project. I remember talking to you about it back then. Um, I, we can definitely pull the plans. And if it's a fire lane, we can make sure that it's posted properly. I don't know if there's a fire lane sign out there. Perhaps you could help me with that if you know, because uh, definitely if there's a fire lane sign. Oh, I well, think I see the Dennis. Curb, the curb's painted red and it has in big white letters on it, fire lane. Okay, it, then it, I know, will so I will follow up. Pretty clear. Okay. okay, so that to me is definitely one I could bring up with the sheriff, because I know, for example, I think in front of Nobu, because we had a problem with violations of the red zone, I think we put a, a no standing meaning you couldn't even park and sit in your car in that area. Yeah, well, so that would be a good idea because it's right, it's right, there's the, the, the driveway that goes into the shopping center off of Trancas is just ahead of that. So when, when cars are coming up the street, you, know, you could have a pedestrian crossing. You know, the, the problem is, is that the, you know, the, they approved the parking lot, and the, but the crosswalk is, is at Trancas. So it's a, it's a pretty fair stretch away from the employee parking lot, which is on the west side. So the 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 the, the idea was, well, uh, you know, all the employers are going to go down to the crosswalk at, at PCH and cross. Right. Well, that never happens. So you know, you have what you have is people crossing there back and forth from that parking lot. So it, it you know, so it's, it's a big hazard, and I you know, I think we should do something. Very good. And what I recall was, I think the buses were supposed to turn around and then wait at the bus stop. Right. Exactly. Uh, which is on the west side of the street. So I will exactly. follow up with the public works director. And my guess is he'll be following up with Captain C2 uh, tomorrow in our director's meeting. And with that, I think I hit all of them. I see a question from Commission or Vice Chair Maza. Yeah, I just want to make uh, a couple of things. On, on the uh, Trancas parking, uh, as I remember, they tried to make that area uh, mandatory parking for loading and unloading for trucks. And it was substandard, so it got changed to a fire lane at the meeting. Um, now, for Jeff, uh, Don Schmitz has promised that his presentation was videoed, and at some point, he will have it online so you can watch the whole thing. I have a, a little bit of disagreement on Zoraces. During the meeting, 2,300 people in Malibu lost power and could not participate. And uh, the city's had a policy, even the city council, of uh, reopening re meetings when the public is not allowed to participate. So I think that's going to have to come back and be reheard. Um, I've spoken to Trevor about it, and that seems to be the direction. Uh, so I just wanted to, if there was, I watched the meeting, I got cut out. If there was a conclusion, I have no idea what it was. I will. Oh, I see Rebecca's got something. I was going to say I can follow up with Trevor and the city manager tomorrow. And Rebecca, did I did speak to Kelsey about it? We we did pause during the meeting to ask the council members who are are the members serving on Zoraces what their preference was. They felt that because we were nearing the end of the meeting and public comment had already closed, that they wanted to continue forward. There was very little discussion that took place after it. As soon as the power outage was confirmed, um, the staff did go to shut the meeting down, but at that point we had already adjourned. So as soon as we were alerted that it, there was a potential for it, um, staff began contacting Southern California Edison. And it's simply that the meeting adjourned before we got a confirmation of the outage. 
but comments were taken after the outage. I don't believe we took any further comments after the outage. I believe once the outage was reported during the meeting, no further questions from members present in the meeting were, uh, were accepted. If you taped it, we can find out. Okay, have we gotten everybody for the moment? Okay, just a couple things for me. I'll make this easy. Um, <clears throat> I was lucky enough to go to the baseball game in San Diego on Saturday. My son called me and said, I've got tickets. Are you coming? And I said, of course. And um, so, yes, we lost. But, you know, 40, in the city that I was born in, uh, there was a lot of 43,140 really happy people in that, in that building. Um, and... 8,000 people on the lawn in the outfield. So uh, it, it was a lot of fun to go. Um, the, the reason I'm kind of bringing this up is I, I, I have to admit, I was looking as I, because I turned around and drove back after the game. So I left it. I, by the time we got an Uber and got to my son's place and I got in the, the G-Wagon to come home, I, I was cruising through that part of town that Commissioner uh, Hill lives in. And, and I did see and I'm not through there all the time, and I'm sure as heck not driving down through that area usually at 2.20 in the morning. However, I did see what I thought was probably an inordinate amount of vehicles that evening on Saturday evening on my way back. So, you know, I, I know that everybody's, these guys are all trying to do a good job of cleaning this up. Our safety commission has done a really, you got to admit, a really good job on this. And <clears throat> so if we can, um, you know, slow these guys up a little bit, but, uh, you know, there there were motorhomes on my way back. I I uh i i saw them and you know maybe maybe that's the normal amount but it seemed like as you said commissioner hill there was a few down that way and um also another one that kind of got the the neighborhood going if you will our our beautiful city was the car show <clears throat> that's two sundays ago i did go to our car show uh down at bluffs park and um there was about a dozen of us there and it was really, it was really kind of nice. We all were talking and everything. And I stayed about an hour and I don't know, 15 minutes, I suppose I left probably at eight 15 and I'm heading home out this way at Trancus and um, I'm going by Zuma and I'm coming down the hill and I went, wow, that looks like a lot of cars. So I go by and I went, Oh, I've got to go check this out. I could tell there was at least a hundred cars. So I turned around, I went to Morning View, did the, the turn, the legal turnaround at Merritt on Commissioner uh, Jennings Street, and then came back to light, made left, went in. Paid my $8 to get in along with all the rest of those cars. And uh, so my thought was, okay, now you've got everybody that was down at the Country Mart, and now you've got them in this great spot. They're all here. And they paid $8 to get in. Figured we're in good shape. This this can't be all bad. And cars came in by the time I left, probably by, I don't know, maybe 10 or so, something like that. There was probably 200 cars there. But it was a, to me, it was a great show. So I left. And um, I guess whatever happens after I left. But I did meet the two people that run the show. And they were excited. And I said, yes, I would try and promote it. But then... As usual, you know, we had the on next door, I was reading that people were leaving the show in a hurry. And this the same thing was going on downtown at Country Mart. And the one thing I did tell them, it's about that's I think I think you can get support as long as everybody just gets there. But you can't you can't take off in a big hurry and you can't make a bunch of noise. And the Lambos are really good at that. And um, uh I said that won't help your case. So I guess that did happen, unfortunately. And I don't know when their next meeting is because they do a quick social media thing. And of course, everybody shows up and, you know, so they come through the canyons and they do that. And that's always been a problem. Um, I'm guessing for longer than even I've been here. And uh, so it was a good thing. And then unfortunately, when people left, they, they hightailed it. And those are the kind of things that, you know, uh, Commissioner Wetton and I can hear out at this end of town. So um, I was I was sorry to, to see that, but I would like to see him get under that. If they have another one, I will go. I will talk to the people running the show. And if you've got to have somebody standing there at the exits and tell them, you know, please don't race or get in a hurry. We, we can continue to have a decent car show along with ours here in town. So um, 
Okay, that's all I have on that. Uh, we can move forward to the consent calendar. Um, anything, I think, Vice Chair Maza? Yeah, I'd like to pull 3B2 and 3B3 for a quick question. Really? Septic tanks? Okay. Nobody else? Well, I've got a disclosure I've, on 3B2. I have a, a business relationship with the owner of that property, so I should probably abstain. Well, it's typically a, yes, it's a receive and file. We don't have to go too far, but um, okay. Um, I see Senior Thompson, or I mean, our, uh, Planner Thompson is here, and... Wait, Chair, do we want to approve the minutes? Because my understanding is 3B2 and 3B3 were pulled, correct, Vice oh, Chair Malza? Okay, very sorry. Um, yeah. Make a motion to approve the minutes, um, right. September you, 6th you, and September 19th. I'll Please second. Uh, roll call, please. Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Wetton? Yes. Chair Smith? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, great. Um, okay, uh, we're on to uh, uh, 3B2, I guess, for a quick couple of questions here. Well, uh, it's both 3B2 and 3B3. My question is, these these were issued on 10-6, um, both of them. And today is the 11th day. And they're good for 10 days to appeal. So number one, my question of uh, Patrick is, has the public had their ability to appeal? And shouldn't we give notice to the public that uh, this is automatically approved? And, and of course, Director Malika, you can interrupt me if I if I get this wrong, but I believe 13 point, sorry, this is the in the LIP, 13.4.11.1 point A deals with requirements for de minimis waivers. And in pertinent states, the planning director's decision on whether to issue a de minimis waiver is not locally appealable. So if the if the issue is getting this item in front of the planning commission, now is the time to do that via the, you know, should that be the, the prerogative of the planning commission. But so that that the the LIP is, is is clear, at least in my reading, that the director's determination is not locally appealable. That may be true, but there's another part of the Coastal Act that says all decisions by the planning director are appealable. I don't know the section. I'm just, this is not a big deal. It's just that uh, you give somebody 10 days to appeal and, and you hear it on the 11th day, uh, it seems something's wrong. So I'm not, did, did you say the, is it in the Coastal Act or the or, or the city's LCP, specifically the LIP? I believe it's in the Coastal Act. I'd have to look it up, but we've had that situation before. We had that on, for example, the determination that you could have a, a, uh, a car dealer in a shopping center. Um, I mean, for sure, some decisions and and you know uh, processes are. However, I believe that the that that LIP code language is, is about as clear as we as we typically get in terms of whether or not something is is appealable. Um, and that is pretty clear in the opposite that it is not locally appealable. Okay, and at what point can it be? Say it was uh, approved on 10, 10, 16, or 10, 6, and it comes to the Planning Commission uh, on 6, 6, 23. Uh, can the planning, planning Commission pull it, or has the time passed? I'm just wondering about, you know, we always give people like one or two days to appeal. In this case, we're giving them minus one day or to make a comment or whatever. Um, now, I am positive in my mind that I found in the codes that all decisions by the planning director are appealable. Um, 
but I'd have to look for them. Uh, I didn't have time today. But uh, at what point, where are the boundaries on these things where you, the public is supposed to know what we're doing? And I have no objection to the projects themselves. I'm trying to clarify why we would do this and why don't we uh, approve these projects by the planning director the day before a meeting or something like that instead of seven days before, in this case, 11 days before, which seems to be our practice. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and, and Director Malika, unless you please interrupt me at any time, I'm not sure necessarily sure there's any strict line of, of, of demarcation there in that if the approval is on the 11th day, 10th day, or 9th day, the items are before you right now. And so if you if you all would like to pull one of these, if that's the that is then then that then that would be the course of action. It would come back for a full CDP. Um there's no prejudice to the city from why from what I can tell or members of the public if the approval date is as I said on the eleventh day, tenth day, or ninth day, these are being reported to you all. If a majority of you all think that hey, we want to take a closer look at this, that is the process. If not, you guys kind of know the drill to receive and file, and then and then we go from there. Director well, Malika, did I miss anything there? No, you you've covered it. So, thirteen point twenty is what Vice Chair Mazzo is pointing out about any decision of a director. However, in thirteen point ten, um, it lists that there are certain types of applications uh, where the planning director first makes a determination on 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 the proposed development. And one of those subsections is, is it exempt from the requirements of a coastal development permit or not? And that's what this falls under. This is under 13.4, it's a de minimis waiver. If somebody feels that we've it's not exempt, it does not qualify for the exemption, it doesn't meet that criteria, uh, then the appropriate course of action would be to forward the matter to the executive director of the Coastal Commission for determination. It's kind of funny the way that works because it's the subject line of that type of that chapter is determination of notice and hearing requirements. It's a little bit misleading uh, because <laughs> I think we have a question here of an exemption. Well, an exemption is actually a determination of notice and hearing because one of the questions is, is this exempt from the requirement of a coastal development permit, which has essentially a hearing procedure. Um, so it would be that section of the code and uh, the and as our attorney has mentioned pat the the code in on this one is extremely clear it says it's not locally appealable meaning that you would use 13.10 and take it to the executive director so isn't every consent item uh exempt from a cdp no these are de minimis waivers. Uh, regular exempt, uh, excuse me, uh, typically what you have on your consent calendar are administrative coastal development permits, and those have a local appeal. Uh, so, for example, if somebody was before you, um, think of, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking of an example, uh, you know, I've got a friend of mine who grew up out there. We, you know, if he came in uh, with his house, up in the knolls and said, hey, I want a new septic system. His house didn't burn. That would be processed as an administrative CDP. Uh, the planning director would make a decision on it because it's administrative, but that would be reported to the planning commission. And you would have the option of either as a commission, you could vote to pull that item and bring it back for a full hearing because you feel that it was not administrative. It should have been a full hearing or uh, within 10 working days of the decision, it could be appealed uh, to this body. And then from there, subsequently appealed to the um, city council. So if you had signed an ACDP on 10-6, we couldn't hear it tonight. It's past its, it's past its appeal period. Uh, we wouldn't have done that. If, if there would have been something to be reported to the planning commission, uh, we would, we schedule those we purposely scheduled me to sign those all the same day so that they all they all come to you. Uh, this being a de minimis waiver is different. Okay, Commissioner Hill. 
Yeah, just to say that it seems like the way it should work is that anything that's reportable to the commission, the 10 day period should not start tolling until it's reported to us. That's all. Okay. As I say, I have nothing wrong with these projects. It's just how would how would the public know and how would they pull it for our discussion and et cetera. And they obviously wouldn't pull those tonight because they didn't even know about it. So um just a question. We'll see. Well okay. Aren't they posted on the agenda? I mean the agenda is posted ahead of time. Yeah. Yes, and 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 sorry, Commissioner Wetton. I know that you were you had an interest, so I would I would advise you to oh, okay. just, just stay out of this one. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> that was good. Um, okay, uh, we're on with uh, we're done with uh, with the de minimis waivers. So we'll go on to four uh, A and uh, a coastal development permit number eighteen dash zero zero two and a variance number of 21-015 application for an interior and exterior remodel of a single family residence associated development this has continued from october 3rd it is 20238 piedra chica road and not within the appealable coastal zone so we have a staff report i would believe first right yes uh good evening chair smith and members of the planning commission the item you have before you tonight is for coastal development permit number 18002 with variance number 21015. I'm going to give a brief history of this project as it does have a long history, but I will try to keep it brief. Um, the item was originally uh, taken in by the planning or taken in by the planning department in September of 2017. The project was originally taken in as administrative plan review. Upon review of the project, it required a relocation of the dispersal field, which required the application to be upgraded to a coastal development permit. The project actually qualified for an administrative coastal development permit review. However, upon the applicant's request, um, we had the project presented to the commission as a full coastal development permit hearing in order to address a number of neighbor concerns. The project was originally scheduled to be heard before the Planning Commission in April of 2019. However, due to a number of neighbor concerns and geotechnical concerns, the item was continued to a date uncertain. The item was officially heard by the Planning Commission in October of 2019. At this Planning Commission meeting, the Commission continued the subject item uh, to allow for clarification from the building official on Building Code Section 110. 0.2.3.4. Subsequently, the item was heard in November of 2019. At this meeting, the commission requested the item be continued in order to receive clarification on um, the square footage of the building uh, prior to 1968, also applicable um, to building code section 110.2.3.4. In December of 2019, this subject item was approved by the Planning Commission. Subsequently, a timely appeal was filed to the City Council. The uh, subject item went to City Council and was remanded back to the Planning Commission in April of 2021. In order to explore further geotechnical issues and factor of safety variants. That is the item you have before you tonight. The square footage of the application did not change. However, a factor of safety variance was added onto the application, as well as um, a reduction in the height by approximately three feet. Next slide, please. Uh, pictured here is a vicinity map and aerial photograph of the subject site. The subject site is located at 20238 Pier de Chico Road off of Big Rock Drive, located within the Big Rock Mesa. Next slide, please. The project description includes the remodel of an existing 3,453 square foot single story, single family residence, a proposed 770 square foot addition that shall not exceed 15 feet in height for a total development square footage of 4,223 square feet the relocation of an existing dispersal field, 
the replacement of existing landscaping, grading, exterior site improvements, and a variance for the geotechnical factor of safety. Next slide, please. Pictured here is the site plan. Outlined in red shows the area of the proposed addition. Next slide, please. Here's the demolition plan for the proposed project. This includes a total of 7% exterior demolition to the existing single family residence. That is compliant with the city's remodel policy. Next slide, please. Pictured here is the floor plan for the proposed 770 square foot addition. Next slide, please. Pictured here are the revised elevations, which show the addition now lowered by approximately three feet. The addition shall not exceed 15 feet in height. Next slide, please. Here's an additional elevation. This is the north exterior elevation. Next slide, please. Pictured here is the area where outlined in red where the dispersal field will be relocated to. Next slide, please. Pictured here are site photographs of the existing of the existing site. Next slide, please. And pictured here are story pool photographs, which were taken in um, the original when the original hearing took place in 2019. Next slide, please. In summary, staff recommends the adoption of resolution 2257, approving coastal development permit 18002, inclusive of the variance number 21015. That concludes staff's presentation. Staff and the applicant are available for any questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Senior Planner Thompson. Um, okay. Commissioners? Uh, we need disclosures. Oh, yes, disclosures. Sorry. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Commissioner Hill? Um, uh, yeah. Um, same as the last time we heard this, I have no pecuniary interest in this. I live over half a mile away. Um, I also should report that on May 14th, 2021, I organized a meeting of six geologists familiar with this area uh, because in prior hearings on this item and, and at least one other item, it seemed to me that the geologists were sort of talking past each other in the Zoom meeting and not really reaching any sort of clarity about what was going on. So I thought if we just put them in a room and let them hash it out, then at least they'll understand each other at that point. And um, as a result, an unforeseen result of that meeting was that they came to some consensus about a few things about Big Rock in general. One being that it has not been fully studied recently enough, and I'm just paraphrasing that now. My, their comments as a secretary I wrote up and I submitted them to the public record at the city council meeting following that May 14th um, meeting. So it's in the public record. Um, and so basically they were, they, one, a couple of things that they wanted to know, uh, all of them, they said, we still don't understand what's happening at the, the lower slide plane of the whole Big Rock area. And they recommended putting in some uh, piezometers, drilling down through the slide plane, putting the, these pressure sensors below the plane to understand really how that surface is working dynamically. Um, they had some other thoughts. I, these were all forwarded to EA and Associates. Um, as far as I know, they have not implemented any of them, but I may be out of the loop at this point, so I, I, I can't say that for sure. I think that's the extent, uh, unless other people have questions that maybe I could answer. Um, well, I'm going to ask a question. Please. You had six geologists. Can you name them? I'm only looking at one right now on this screen that might I know would have been there. Yeah, we, we, five, had, we had Don Kovaleski, we had um, uh, e, e. Don Michaels was there, we had two UCLA geologists, uh, Peter Bird was one, uh, the other one escapes my name offhand, and we had a guy who's now at USGS but had worked on this previously as a private consultant, and a guy at um, Cal State Long Beach who had also worked in this area on this slide. I can 
I, again, I have to point you to the public record on this. I, I don't think it's particularly germane tonight, except to say that they all agreed that the slide is not as well understood as it should be. Okay. Um, okay, uh, Vice Chair Mazin. I uh, I had a long discussion with Adrian this afternoon about two items of my concern, and that was the three to one slope and uh, the variance. Nothing that isn't in the staff report. Commissioner Wetton. Uh, no, no disclosure. I've, I've driven by the project and uh, uh, read it, but that's it. Okay. Commissioner Jennings. A conversation with Adrian today, uh, basically uh, on the outlines of the problem presented, and but nothing that's not in the staff report. Uh, I too spoke with Adrian, and uh, and I'm of the same uh, notation there. No, no change. Um, okay. We have a Dan Allen. I don't recognize. Um, so that is a member of the applicant team. Oh, okay. If, I believe um, if you're ready to begin, oh, if you're ready to open the public. I, I am, and he, let's bring him aboard here. So the first speaker for the applicant team is actually Dan Sakahara, but he might be in under Dan Allen uh, of Atelier Architects. If you're present in the meeting under another name, if you could click the raise hand button at the bottom of the screen, and Dan Allen is raising his hand. Um, yes, yes. Also available for questions uh, following his presentation are the owners, uh, Don Kowaleski, who is a soils engineer and our soils consultant, and Fred Gaines, their attorney. Okay. Um... Where'd he go, Mr. Allen? We want to unmute, unmute Mr. Allen. Hi, uh, I'm Dan Allen. And just a correction, um, uh, it is Dan Allen, my partner and wife is Robin Sakahara. Our firm is uh, Sak Sakahara Allen Architects, um, not related to Atelier Architects. Uh, um, uh, I have a slide presentation to, to show, so. Um, I believe staff will be showing that. Okay, thank you. Hi, Mr. Chairman, do we have a clock? We do have a clock. I was waiting for um, Alicia to bring up his presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Chair Smith and members of the Planning Commission. Um, as I stated, I'm, I'm the architect for the project. After having been previously approved by this commission, we're here tonight because in 2019, this project was appealed by a neighbor. And prior to the city council hearing for that appeal last year, it was determined that a variance was required. To support the findings for approval of the variance, our project geologist, Don Kowalowski, submitted a report documenting the project features which improve the stability of the landslide. These include the project septic system, which was changed from seepage pits to an evapotranspiration system, the foundation and grading, which will slightly reduce the weight of the landslide, and the project paving and drainage, which re will reduce groundwater infiltration. City geotechnical staff has reviewed the report, project design, and has approved the project. Also, four weeks ago, we reached an accommodation with the appellant, um, and now they support the project. You've also received multiple messages of support from people in the neighborhood, for which I and the owners are grateful to see after the years of difficulty. I will now briefly review the project and the features that are beneficial. Next slide, please. Our project is a continuation of improvements to the property that began in 2005 under a previous owner. Because of the unique opportunities of this home being adjacent to an unbuilt lot, he developed an addition similar to ours along with a lot merger and replacement of the aging septic pit with a new advanced evapotranspiration or ET type OWTS. This project plan shown here was approved by the Planning Commission in 2006 and the building permits were issued the same year. Next slide. The addition was not built as the owner moved to another larger property in Malibu, but he did follow through with the lot merger and installation of the new evapotranspiration OWTS shown here. This would allow for a future addition by a new owner due to reduction in the volume of groundwater effluent. Next slide. I'd like to emphasize the significance of the ET system that was installed. The existing deep seepage pits that drain into the mesa were capped and replaced with tertiary treatment, UV disinfection, and shallow subsurface drip dispersal. 
This laid the groundwork for adding future plumbing fixtures with a net reduction in groundwater infiltration. Compared to seepage pits, which put all the wastewater into the ground, the ET system is designed to reduce groundwater absorption by 90% as the effluent both evaporates and transpires from the irrigated landscape. This use as irrigation also reduces the amount of imported water for landscape. As noted by the Departments of Geology and Environmental Health, advanced ET systems are the best type of system for the MESA, reduce the volume of water entering the deep subsurface, and are a net benefit compared to traditional seepage pits. Next slide. For our project, part of the ODBTS is being relocated to make room for the addition. The slide shows the existing site and house with a portion of the dispersal field to be relocated in red. Next slide. And this slide shows the addition with replacement dispersal field in green. Next slide. To ensure current soil conditions meet the dispersal field requirements, this area of the site was tested for percolation to double check the already functioning ET system would work in the new location. Next slide. Next, I'd like to briefly review the project to show how the design fits the neighborhood, meets the height requirements, and improves site drainage by directing stormwater off the mesa. This slide shows the existing property and immediate neighbors. Next slide. This slide shows an illustration of the proposed addition. As you can see, the full house is of similar size to the neighbors and the remaining one third of the lot still provides unobstructed ocean views to the northern uphill neighbors. Next slide. This is a street view of the story poles taken four years ago, showing the addition height is consistent with the existing house relative to the sloping street. As per the agreement reached with the previous appellant, we've agreed to reduce the addition height to be three feet lower than is shown here. Next slide. This is an illustration of the street view before and after, reflecting the new lower height. Next slide. Similar elevation of the house before and after, also showing how the prop property steps up to the east left, slot, left side, which the addition follows. Most of the addition is several feet lower than the city of Malibu height limit of 18 feet, shown dash. Next slide. Project will also benefit groundwater levels by reducing permeable surfaces and directing captured rainwater to the existing storm drain system in the street. As noted by geotechnical engineer Lauren Doyle in a Big Rock Mesa presentation to city council, adding impermeable land coverage like pavement and home roofs are a form of passive dewatering, which has a net benefit to the Mesa stability due to reduced water infiltration. Next slide. In previous meetings, concerns have been raised about local stability of the property and the addition. This has been addressed by the design of a deepened pile foundation system recommended by the project geologist. The slide shows a geological cross section through the existing house and upper yard. Next slide. This slide shows the addition with concrete grade beams and friction piles that will bear a minimum of 10 feet into the existing suitable dense soil at the level of the existing house. Next slide. Lastly, I think it is useful to consider the overall mix stability of the Mesa as documented by consulting geology firm Ye and Associates, who oversees the monitoring and maintenance of the Big Rock Mesa landslide district. Their latest report shows the Mesa is stable and the dewatering system is working. Monitoring well data show the groundwater levels under the landslide continue to decrease with a recent yearly drop of five feet in the eastern region, which is the area of our project. Next slide. The report also confirms that the dewatering system production increased despite well below average rainfall. Slope inclinometers, which measure the deep ground layers, show no quantifiable movement. And a new program of monitoring surface cracking of roadways shows no discernible patterns of movement. In conclusion, we ask that you accept staff recommendation and approve the variance. In the design of this project, we've done everything possible to improve the stability of the property and the MESA as a whole. If there are any questions, the owner, resident Bobby, project geologist Don Kowalowski, and attorney Fred Gaines are available. Thank you. Next slide. And I'd like to reserve the re remaining time for rebuttal. Okay, and you have that. Thank you. You'll have eight minutes and 32 seconds remaining for rebuttal. Okay. And uh, what do we have? Will we have uh, anybody pub from the public who want to speak on this? We do. Our first public speaker will be Hushang Vahidi. I believe I saw a uh, Jasmine Vah Vahidi in the meeting, so I would guess that that would be what you'd be unmuting. Followed by Norm Haney. Followed by Rosemarie Eddy. Dennis. Oh yes. 
Uh, sorry to interject. I had one more disclosure, which is that I had asked Jessica for a list of houses within 500 feet that had had uh, similar size or larger remodels done since the beginning of cityhood. Um, and I can talk about the numbers on those on that list if and when we get to that point. I don't know whether it'll be relevant or not, um, but she she did send me a um, a spreadsheet of some houses that have ha had applications for various things in within the 500 foot radius. So okay, very good. Thank yeah. you. Um, hey, at this time, Husheng Hidi. Yes. Welcome. Hi, everybody. This is Hushang Wahedi. I am living in uh, Piedra Chica, 4218, already 25 years. And the, the addition to my side is two, two, before was two land, before this owner was two land. One, the line, land beside me, it was completely dry. And I have no problem. But now there is, when he added to the other uh, land, it's going to be one piece. No, this, there is planning, there is trees, there is a sprinkler, and my house is sliding to his, his property. And if I send it this before to, I send this before to city, this is the way it is. And I need badly, the retainer one to save my house. That is only my whatever I'm asking. I need retainer wall badly because the, the house is sliding to his property. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vahidi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Norm Haney. Mr. Haney, welcome. We've okay. got you. You can hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I was asked to uh, mention a few things on this project, uh, primarily because um, I've chaired the Wastewater Advisory Committee for the past 20 years. And it seems to me like this project uh, has done virtually everything possible uh, to increase the safety of the Big Rock Mesa. Now, albeit it's only one house and it's not going to make a substantial difference, but the difference that it is going to make is positive. Basically, the safety issue with the Big Rock Mesa is the amount of water that percolates down uh, and does two things. It increases the driving force because of the weight of the water itself. It also reduces the friction along the slide plane. Currently, uh, we're witnessing the lowest water table uh, that's ever been determined um, in the Big Rock Mesa history. This project reduces the amount of water that is percolating into the, into the ground. It's doing that by changing from seepage pits to evapotranspiration in which what's mentioned here is 70 to 90 percent of the effluent that goes into the system actually um, evaporates into the air. It never makes it down to the slide plane. And my, my uh, knowledge is that it's between 70 and 80% of the water. So this project actually reduces the amount of water going down and probably greater, a greater, greater reduction in water than 90% of the other homes that are uh, existing on the Big Rock Mesa. So I uh, am strongly in support of the project. I think if it were possible, everyone should go to an evapotranspiration uh, system uh, to reduce the amount of water going down. It's 
this is an unusual situation where it actually has two lots. Most people only have one and they have no choice but to use a seepage pit. Uh, but this project uh, should be approved uh, because it, it actually uh, is a safer project than 90% of the other homes that are on the Big Rock Mesa and probably 98%. Um, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haney. Our next speaker will be Rosemary Eady, followed by Joe Drummond. And then if anyone else is present in the meeting who wishes to provide public comment, please indicate so by clicking the raise hand button while these two next two speakers are presenting. Go ahead, Ms. Eady. Unmute, okay. Yeah, my name is Rosemary Eide, and I have lived here since 1974. My husband bought the house in 1966. And basically nothing has changed since the same application in October of 2019. There has been some soil moved around and some gravel brought in, and maybe that's part of that evaporation system. Um, the seepage is not good in our neighborhood. We're below the house. And they add, well, whatever footage to the 2,800 square foot house. Um, so it's going to end up with, I don't know how many square feet they will have. But anyway, they will have a bedroom and 20 with 21 extra faucets. That would be a 70% 70 incre 70 increase from the 34 existing faucets, a total of 55. A giant bathtub. We have a giant bathtub, but we cannot use it because we don't have a big enough septic or whatever that they call it, uh, evaporation system. And then they want a bigger septic system from 1700 gallons to 2300 gallons. That's a 33% increase of capacity and uh, maybe you should have Eli's pumping the owner, Eli, maybe he can explain how all that works. Because I talked with him, or he talked to me several years ago in 2019. Um, this development site is on fill. When they graded the development, the, the parcels for the development in the 1950s and 60s, and it's fill. And Don Michael also talked about that. So, and to build on fill is really not that great. Basically, everybody who lives above their property is going to be okay. It's just the poor folks who are below their property. And time, of course, will tell. So actually, Malibu had a landslide today. I don't know if you saw that in the news. So anyway, I think, yeah, many well-meaning neighbors submitted letters in favor of this addition, and I wished I could do it too. But I have lived here and we are for so many years and we're below, and there are many other neighbors below, and we do not know what the future will hold for us. So that's all my take. And um, so anyway, that's it. Oh, by the way, please check 2259 Inland and also 2239, um, there is water standing. Inland, 239 inland is in the street. And the other one, 259 inland, it's in front on the property. It's next to the pump. Okay, thank you. And that does conclude your time. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond. Go ahead, Ms. Drummond. Hi there, Honorable Planning Commission. As you know, we have been in conflict with the Nababis over this project for almost five years. Then one of our kind neighbors agreed to mediate between Reza and myself a few weeks ago, and we decided to think about the long game rather than the short and costly wins. We are tired of fighting with our neighbors and having the street be at war. Some neighbors weren't as concerned about the geology as we were educated on, but as, as our mediating neighbor told us, the legal fees were piling up on us. In the end, should, sorry. In the end, should the project have been possibly finally approved years from now, we would have ended up in court only over a height violation of our mutual CCNRs. 
Reza and I decided to split the difference in lowering the height of the project to half of what we could have reduced it to if we played the long game with the CCNRs. We are glad to be finally at peace with our neighbors and can support this project only with the height revised plans that you have here before you, which is a maximum of 14.5 feet, not 15 feet, as stated by Jessica, from the lowest natural grade. You can decide as commissioners if you want to put any conditions on the updated project to satisfy their adjacent neighbor, Hu Shang, who has concerns about the safety of his own property, but we support the project with this new lowered height plans with no other changes. I do believe all landscaping is to be limited in heights for the project also. This is why you did not receive a long letter of opposition from our attorney, which we, will, we were ready to send until the mediation happened. We will take the risk at the cost of being good neighbors and hopefully can end this legal battle once and for all. Thank you for your consideration and help to make peace in our neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. And um, at this time, we'll return to the applicant team if they would like to use their time for rebuttal. If you'll give me just a moment, I'll reset your clock. Okay. Um, so if you could unmute Dan Allen, please. Hi, I, I, um, this is Dan. I'd, I'd actually like to um, ask Don Kowalowski to respond to some items. Um, I don't know if he was able to raise his hand. So if you could uh, uh, mute me and then unmute Don, please. Thank you. Um, this is Don Kowalowski. As you know, I'm an engineering geologist, been out in the area for a long period of time. The neighbor next door who is complaining about what he calls movement of his land, I looked up the geotechnical records for the grading of the tract of homes. He is on earth fill that was compacted to the standard of the 1950s and 60s, which when we found that on the property that's subject to the addition today, we found that to be of a poor quality, and that's the reason why we deepened our foundations down to the good quality material underneath. His property is upslope of his property, and I believe that because of the descending natural slope that existed prior to the development of this tract of homes, the earth fill on his property gets thicker from the uphill side to the downhill side. And as a consequence, his property is undergoing differential settlement and not land movement. A retaining wall on the subject property would do no good whatsoever to support his property. He should get his own geotechnical investigation to determine why that is happening on his house and not blame it on the neighbor. With respect to all the items dealing with the septic system, I'm the one that recommended the evapotranspiration system in the first place because being in Big Rock, around Big Rock, since it started moving as a county geologist and then being subsequently the city geologist, I'm a firm believer that decreasing the amount of groundwater is very beneficial, and that's the reason I recommended this. We also performed the necessary evaluations for the city with respect to the hazard waiver, and we have we meet all the criteria for that. And to go back to what was said earlier by one of the commissioners about the public, or about the meeting between the individual geologists, yes, I agree. We have never had all of the information we would like to have on the Big Rock Mesa landslide. Um, and it would be nice to get more, but it's expensive to get it. And as a consequence, we are relying on what was done by the various consultants, which was Bing Yen and then Fugro and now Ye, who are evaluating that. And they're the ones that really have found that the dewatering of the Mesa has improved the overall stability where our safety factor should be very close to 1.4 at this point in time. It might be a little less than that, still under the 1.5. And that's the reason why we have the landslide waiver that has been requested. If there's anything that the commissioners like to ask, I'd be glad to answer those. And are there any other members of the applicant team who would like to speak at this time? And seeing none? I don't think so. Um, so Chair Smith, if you'd like to, you could conclude the public hearing portion of the meeting. Okay, we will do that. Um, 
we close that and back to the table here. Uh, Commissioner Hill's got his hand up. Thank you, Chair Smith. Um, yeah, I just a couple observations and then I'm going to have some questions for Don. Um, just to be clear, so everybody understands there's there are apparently two separate geological domains that we're talking about, one being the greater slide area. And Ye has worked a lot on that uh, with some caveats. And the other being the uh, hypothetical, theoretical, um, localized perched water conditions, sort of a little shelf or a bowl that we heard might exist under a few houses or maybe a handful of houses. It's not really certain. Um, but there, the evidence towards that is has been the ponding of water in places, the drainage to the lot down on Inland Lane. Uh, it's possible that the uh, house upslope of this, the, uh, the Vahedi house, would be subject to that. So we're not really sure. So, well, I guess before I get to that question, I should, I, I, I'm concerned that Fugro and then Ye. Um, have not actually, as, as had been represented or at least implied here tonight, have not specified a factor of safety since Bing Yen's report in 1992, I believe it was, um, that yes, they are every year documenting how much water is being taken out of the hill and how high the groundwater is and so forth. And there's a big assumption that lower groundwater correlates directly with greater safety. And that's probably true, but uh, not necessarily to a certain point. And I know that in the hearing on Inland Lane, um, there were questions about stability and both Lauren Doyle and Rob Dubow in that hearing had asked EA to weigh in about the factor of safety and the stability. And they, they could not or would not answer questions about stability directly. So, um, I, my first question to Don is maybe I've missed something along the way here. Has Ye in the meantime um, specified a, a factor of safety number? Uh, you said that you think it might be around 1.4 now. Have they actually come up with that number? Don? Yes, we unmuted. Yeah, please unmute Don. And by the way, Don, I hope, I hope you're doing better. You sound good. I Thank you. It was actually an eye infection. Yeah. Um, so with respect to Ye, Ye has not prevented, presented that. But I'm using that safety factor is when Bing Ye did their original report in 1993, they gave a range of safety factors and they indicated when the groundwater got down to a certain point, the factor of safety would be 1.4. That groundwater is actually lower than the number that they had at that point in time. That's the reason I'm making that assumption. But Ye has not made that, and I definitely think that they should. Okay, and and I'm and let me back up for a second here. A couple more questions, probably for you too. But just to more generally, my concerns about the geology and specifically this localized potential perch thing really speak to my bigger concerns and questions about the variance and whether that's something that can be granted. Um, you know, whether we can grant a variance for a safety related. Uh, code. Um, so that, that's, that's why I'm talking about all the geology right now. And to be clear, in 2005, you weighed in on the application, and we got this in the prior staff report. And at the time, you pointed out that on this particular lot, that, the subject lot, that caving, I'm quoting here, caving should be anticipated in these earth materials. And uh, that's page 16 of that 2005 report and on page 21 caving was observed in the test pits particular care should be taken when excavating and working around excavations in the event of possible caving um i know you've got the piles specified here so that seems like a step in the right direction but i'm also wondering have there been no further test bores done recently especially given that this theory of the perched condition came up have, have has that not been explored any further with, with test bores? Okay, I'm gonna answer both of those. First, <laughs> was um, picked up within the 
poor quality earth fill, which overlies the better quality native soils. And when these excavations were made, they were vertical walled trenches. They were not slopes at two to one like we have around the periphery of the property. They would not have had caving on two to one slopes, but definitely within vertical walls, they did have caving. And I notified, put in my report that that was a possibility. So anybody doing an excavation on the property, we'd know that they had to shore their trenches so they didn't have a hazard to anybody working in or around the trenches. With respect to the groundwater, that is not something, I hit a high moisture content in the bottom of my trenches. Um, that I didn't call it groundwater at the time. Subsequently, I believe Don Michael said there was some moisture seeping out of the lowest portion of the slope on the property to the southeast, but he could not verify that that was groundwater. It could have been leaking um, water irrigation systems. Um, with respect to standing water in the streets, I'm sorry, I have no knowledge with respect to that or no opinion with respect to that. I'm aware that people have reported it, but I have no opinion. If you go back to the documents in the Yay report, which indicates groundwater, they have various different piezometers in there indicating where groundwater exists, and none of them indicate that there's a perch water condition in this area. Uh, and their, their wells would pick that up, in your opinion? That they, yeah, they yes, they should. They do have them in the right place. Yes, okay. there's one right in front of this property. Well, as, as you mentioned, the, the water coming out, seeping out on the property below down on Inland Lane, um, there was some testing of that, and they determined that it wasn't irrigation from that site because they turned off the water for a few weeks, or I don't remember the period now, but um, and I think that was City Public Works actually helping on that. And at some point, you had said that maybe it would be helpful to, and this was in 2019 at that hearing, I think, that it would be helpful to have some kind of dye or other marker uh, to track movement to see if anything coming from the subject site was, was leaking out on Inland Lane. And one of the other geologists said a radio, radioactive tracer would show up in a few days. Um, but am I correct that none of that was attempted, right? Uh, first of all, not, as far, my knowledge, none of it was attempted. And second of all, radioactive tracer would not show up in a few days because groundwater moves so slowly yeah. that it would take weeks to months to be to come out. Yeah, okay. All right, well, okay, leaving the, the geology for the moment, I, I may have some other question there, but my, my concerns about the variance are on a couple levels. And this is this is maybe more for everybody, not just for Don. And maybe not, maybe not even for Don. Um, one thing that we have to do, well, one I mentioned already, it's a safety related regulation. So A, I'm sort of nervous about saying, well, let's just grant a variance to that, especially since the assumption of risk and release is a, a two party document. And so there are third parties who don't benefit from that or whose safety is potentially put in risk by putting this waiver in and they don't get to have a say in that. So that bothers me a little bit. And then also when granting a variance, we have that the whole code discourse of um, the privileges and um, deprivations. And I'd be concerned about, I have been concerned about whether granting this would be creating new precedent in Big Rock. Um, and so, as I mentioned before in disclosure, I had asked Jess Jessica for a list of remodels since cityhood within 500 feet. And what I did in finding that out there, uh, I found basically six properties that might be relevant. Two of them, one of them was this property. One of them is the house on Inland Lane, both of which don't exist. Um, they haven't been done. They may never be done. Uh, there was the 2005 approval on this property, not built. There's the Inland Lane approval, but that is still pending. Um, it's not ripe. It's still under appeal at the Coastal Commission. So that decision is not final. And that house doesn't exist either. So then if we remove those two houses from consideration, there are four other remodels within 500 feet that average 134 square feet. Um, I can list them. They are 20458 Roca Chica is 200 square feet additional. That's the biggest one. 
20473 Roca Chicas for 80 square feet additional. Uh, and two, um, oh, this print is pretty small. 20436 Roca Chica, that's 192. And 20245 was 65 square feet. So that's a, an average of 134. The biggest one is 200. If we're going to go ahead and allow a 770-ish sum, I forget the exact number, that's a substantial leap in terms of anything that might be granted in Big Rock. Um, and again, with the safety concerns in mind, I, maybe I'm sort of dominating here. I'll, I'll leave those on the table, let other people jump in, and, and I might have other questions to come back to. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hill. Vice Chair Maza. Yeah, I have, uh, I'll go back to the geology in a minute, but a um, couple things just to clear up. Jessica, the the uh, slides that the architect showed showed the pillars on the street filled in with bushes. Obviously, at some point, the 42-inch rule was applied, and now it appears in the drawings that it's going to be solid material. Is there anything in the the staff report or in the resolution that requires them to be code compliant on hedges. There's no new proposed hedges. The existing, because it's not a new single family residence, the property is not required to be brought into conformance um, for existing non conformities. I will double check. I believe there was a previously issued code violation for um, the hedges that I think was resolved. So let me just, if you don't mind, double checking that. That was already resolved. Okay, um, but this lot was merged. The time this was put in, there was no house, there were no permits. So why would it be grandfathered? <clears throat> yes, let me, if you just give me one second, I'm going to double check because they may have already removed them. So let me check. Vice Chair Maza? Yes. Is this really? Really a tough one here, a hedge? Well, it is because when you look down that street, you can see the ocean. And again, the people in Balboa's views are important. If you go out to Point Doom, you no longer see the mountains. You don't see any. You don't even know you're on a point. You might be in Sherwood Forest. So when a property comes up for an approval, uh, I want to find out why there are a bunch of pillars and then, in, then they're filled in with with uh, uh, fencing material, which indicates to me that they were never approved to be a solid fence six feet high. And it is in our code. I mean, if if your attitude is things in our code that we don't care about, then let's take them out of the code. That, that's not it. But this this doesn't seem like this is the drop dead issue of the evening. That's it's all. not, but it's part of the resolution. And that it's, I'm not holding it up for a drop dead issue. We can wait for the answer. but. Uh, I just want to bring up stuff that should be in the resolution if it's not. Um, and, and I can make a motion saying if it has not priorly been approved, then it should be banned, uh, especially when you have a property that was not owned at the time that happened and had no, it's not new, it's not old development. There is no house on that lot. Okay. Uh, Director Malika. Yeah, um, thank Go ahead. The question I have of staff is, this is reported to be a three to one project, whole property, three to one. But obviously from the pictures and obviously from the drawings, this, the one lot is lower than the other. And there's a stairway in between, a stair step in between. And so, and Jeff knows we went through this Ad infinitum in the past about whether you bridge that or you or you don't. But uh, it's my it's my knowledge or my understanding that we have never changed the code on saying certain areas of a property are exempt from slope analysis. So, I uh, my question would be: since the removal of the retaining walls, which I don't know if they were permitted or not, once it's removed. It is now a slope, and 
should we condition how that slope is forward since it appears to be over three to one? And our code requires under over whatever it is, three to one, that you do something about it. You grant a variance. And I have no problem with a variance. It's just uh, it can be abused. You could have an explanation. Oh, it was it was flat because there was a retaining wall. Well, if you had a hundred foot retaining wall and then 10 feet later, you had another hundred foot retaining wall and you took them out, is it three to one or is it one to one? You know, so there's a, a level at which you just make these things clear. I have no problem with either one as long as they reconcile with the code. So my question is, is it really three to one? And what is the difference between the level of the lots? If you look at his slide of the lot, when you look at the green lot, when you see the top of the other house next door, it does not indicate three to one flat lot. Um, just a question. Okay, Director well, Malika had his hand up a minute ago. So to, oh, Jessica may be saying the same thing I'm about to say. Um, on condition 39, of the attached resolution 22-57. The hedges in the front yard are required to be maintained at 42 inches and the side and rear yards are six feet. That's consistent with the language that's in chapter 17. Uh, so there is a condition on the landscaping. So is that. And then Jessica, did you wanna to speak to the change in grade? Sure, and actually we're putting up the color-coded slope analysis as well. I just sent to our IT folks so we can all look at it together. And while we're waiting for that to come up, I did want to mention that we also have Lauren Doyle and Mike Phipps and Paolo, Paolo I can't pronounce your name, Paolo Quinto, uh, present in the meeting and available to respond to questions. Alicia, are you good putting up that slide? Oh, there we go. It's a little bit blurry, but um, you can see that the the area that you're in question, um, where the retaining walls are located at the center of the property there, um, like Commissioner Meltz said, those retaining walls um, will be removed in order to place the addition. However, the color-coded soap analysis here conducted goes over a span of the area. Um, which uh, which shows that measured at less than four to one slopes there. Okay, let me ask you a question on that. You're basing this blue area on the fact that there's three retaining walls and the land in between them are one to one, are flat. Now, this project, we're asked to approve a demolition of those walls. So my question is, we measure from natural or finished grade, not from a grade from some time in the past. So what is the drop between the right-hand lot and the left-hand lot? And, how, and what is the slope between the two? Because it obviously drops, they're not the same level. Let me take a Here's my microphone's on, I hope. Uh, there appears to be about a, we'll say four, uh, say three to five foot variant. And it's not the same throughout. Most of it's about four feet. In some areas, it's a little less. In one area, it's a little more. And when you do a slope analysis, it's, we're using 10 foot contours um, over a given space of land because yeah, I, there'll, there'll be little regularities. And the idea of the slope analysis is just to look for the general trend and identify the hillside. Um, and when using the standard practice of the city of 10 foot contours, even with the retaining wall, the retaining walls are actually shown on this. You, you see them there because of the way the formula works over a given distance, it, it comes out to a three to one 
uh, at the steepest part three to one as identified in uh, sheet A3.3. Okay, so there's eight stairs down. So you're saying those stairs are six inch stairs. Uh, this is not a big deal, but I, I uh, think it's misinterpreted, but it's not a huge deal. Now, the, the real problem I have with this project is the findings. And I know that the first time it went through, it did not have the finding on uh, stability. And that's been added. And I wonder why I, I checked um, California co uh, building code 10, comma, 2, comma, 3, comma, 4. And it says that you don't have to worry about building in a hazard zone if it's less than 25% addition to a remodel. So this property, in my opinion, is exempt from the basic geological findings we're, we're trying to make here. The problem I have is, is when you do make the finding and it's finding one, F1 under hazard, it says the project as proposed will neither be subject to nor increase the instability of the site. But everything we've heard tonight and everything in the staff report says it does not increase the instability of the site. But uh, and this is what I'd, I'd like to ask Don Kowaleski is, uh, and, and could you unmute him if he's not unmuted? Uh, I'm unmuted. Go ahead, John. Okay. Is the big rock slide being, as you say, under 1.4, uh, not 1.5, is it by definition of 10, 2, 3, and 4 of the building code, uh, unstable. And the way I read it, you have to be 1.5 to not be unstable. Okay. So let's go to what those numbers actually mean. The upper number is the resisting force from preventing, from preventing a land from moving. And the lower number is the driving force. And these numbers are measured in the multi-millions. When you divide one by the other, you come into very low numbers. So for a safety factor of 1.5, you have 50% more resisting force than driving force. So it certainly shouldn't move. But in fact, if you had a one to one, it's exactly balanced. Anything less than one should move. Anything above one should not move. And the reason why we use the 1.5 is there's so many unknowns when it comes to geology that we want to have a comfort safety factor. So the building code when it allowed for a waiver in the county of Los Angeles, as you know, I was once a county geologist, it was 1.25 and above you could have a waiver, below 1.25 you could not have a waiver, and above 1.5 you did not need a waiver. But 1.25 and above is certainly stable in almost every geologist's mind. Something less than one, everybody would say it's unstable. And then there's this never, never land between one and 1.25. So I'm going to say, yes, it's absolutely stable, but it's not to the safety factor of 1.5. Right, but that's not, that's not the finding we're making. We're, we're making, trying to make a finding saying that the, pro, the proposed priority will be subject to it, will not, neither be subject to it nor increase the instability. Well, it is somewhat unstable, correct? It's not 1.5. You you recommend it deep I'm, I'm sorry, John, but you're there's actually been some legal cases during the <clears throat> those safety factors of 1.5 and 1.25 and 1.1. And there has been no justification justification by anybody to say that 1.5 is in fact stable. Anything over 1.1 is theoretically stable. But we want to have a comfort factor in there because we know there's so many unknowns that could lead to a lesser safety factor if we knew all of the data. And out here, we certainly don't know all the data. And that's the reason why anything above one is stable. I'm saying anything above 1.25 would be rationally stable and above 1.5 is unquestionably stable. 
and so why did you recommend a, a, a fancier uh, a load bearing system? I mean, the, because the upper poor quality earth fill is subject to settlement. So they're putting in pilings to penetrate that and get into the good quality material below. But if you were to look at my geologic report, and one of the maps came up here, it shows QLS um, in two places above and below. Below the one was said S, and above and above one, I think, said um, P for poor quality. Um, and so we're getting through that poor quality material into the good quality material. Therefore, we will not have a differential settlement problem. It has nothing to do with slope stability. In this area, there's nothing you can do about slope stability because the landslide is actually, the base of the landslide is over 150 feet below the, the ground surface in this area. And there's no way you can put caissons that deep to try and hold something up. So yeah, that's, that's right. my question. Um, right. Now, the Colorado River is at a 10,000 year low. And I don't think anybody suspects that it's going to go lower. Um, we haven't had rain in a decade. So what factors would change on the big rock landslide if we had the same amount of rain, uh, normal rain instead of the drought years? And would that increase the instability? All right. It would decrease the safety factor, but not increase the instability. Sorry, that's student waste because you, you're assuming that unstable is less than 1.5. I said unstable is less than 1.0. Um, the rainfall absolutely will decrease um, the safety factor, but the dewatering system that's in there has proven to bring the groundwater down substantially below the time when it was actually moving. And since they've been pumping it down, we've had no significant movement. I hate significant, use that term, but during the Northridge earthquake, it moved a quarter of an inch but it did not represent that at the ground surface. That was only in the slide plane itself. And due to increased groundwater, we've had no measurable movement. It's only because of the Northridge earthquake and any future earthquakes. And Bing Yen indicated that during a strong six plus magnitude earthquake in the Malibu Coast Fault, which is right there in PCH, could move two feet. And that's the entire Big Rock Mesa area, not just this lot, obviously. How much did it move during the uh, when it six, was red -minded? Six feet. Between 1982 and 1986, it moved approximately six feet. And what caused that? That was the Big Rock Mesa landslide due to high groundwater. They originally, they when the track was developed, they knew they had a potential issue with groundwater and slope stability, so they put in a dewatering system. They turned the dewatering system, the developers, over to the homeowners. The homeowners decided it cost too much money to keep those wells running, and they turned it off. When they turned it off, the groundwater rose, so then 1982, and definitely by 83, it started to move. And then we came in with the assessment district, which installed additional dewatering devices, which are horizontal drains and vertical wells, which brought the groundwater back down and has been relatively stable since. Okay, thank you. Uh I uh, I am very reluctant to make the the findings on hazards when we didn't have to include them in the original project that was approved and then appealed, and to to take a subject property on one little part of Big Rock and say, gee, well, it hasn't rained in a long time and the wells have been pumping and so it's not, it's stable. I'm very reluctant to make that statement uh, when we don't have to. Uh, this is exempt uh, from uh, the 10.2.3.4 or comma, not point, uh, of the building code. And this is the California building code. Uh, we adopted it as city council and it's it's our code. So. Um, I'm going to suggest when we finally get done with this that we eliminate uh, variance, uh, hazard variance that, uh, number eight for hazards. Uh, I don't think it's required. It's setting a precedent without 
without, as Craig said, no work has been done in over 10 years to study this. It went before the city council. The Big Rock people brought it up. There was supposed to be a new assessment district. There was supposed to be new wells. There's supposed to be inclinometers, all kinds of stuff that apparently never happened. Um, and we're sitting at a point where we have the mega drought of all time uh, in, in California. Uh, and at the low point of that, on one, one little house that does not need it, we're making a determination that can be used as a, pre as a precedent for other houses. Uh, and, and I know we will probably get the answer, nothing's a precedent for anybody else, but uh, it comes up all the time. So uh, those are basically my problems. If we can get rid of this finding, which I don't think we can make, because the definition of, despite somebody's Don's representation that, yeah, downtown LA, they decided one and a quarter is okay. Uh, the code says 1.5. And uh, I go by the code. So uh, hopefully we can get rid of this, get this thing passed. Those are my questions for now. Okay. Um, hang on, Commissioner Hill. Uh, Mr. Donegan, you had your hand up. Yeah, I mean, just briefly, and, and I just want to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page here that the my vice, vice chair Mazda did accurately reflect the LA County Building Code, which adopted the state, and we adopt the LA County. Um, there's also a separate body of authority in that it's the city's LIP that also has development standards. So while that building code is very, very pertinent to the city's building official, in terms of when he or she may or may not issue a permit and how that is processed. The city's LIP is a, is a distinct and separate entity requiring certain development standards that the whatever the building code says is not dispositive. But that's all I would like to add, Chair. Thank you. Well, let me ask you a question on that. When this was passed, I guess it was five years ago, same MMC, same everything else, and that requirement was not put in. How did that happen? Or was that was that an error on the part of the planning commission or the staff? Or somebody just forgot to do it or it wasn't required? We Commissioner Mazar, are you referring to the hazard finding? Yes. When you say requirement? Um, I'll look at the 2005 report, but in the original staff report um, from October of 2019, staff did include that original finding. Um, finding for LIP chapter nine, it's finding one. Staff did well, include that, but I will uncheck for the 2005. Uh, you, you don't have to check if I'm wrong, but uh, I seem to remember in, in the staff report, the history of the project, when it was sent back by the city council, staff reported that that was not in there. I think the confusion here is, I show my mic's on, sorry, new computer. <laughs> so make sure I got it right. Um, You're old one with Jeff. Yeah, <laughs> I'll tell that to Alex. I turned it in, they gave me this guy here. Um, the, I, I believe that the, the point is that when this was approved by the Planning Commission, uh, the, the variance for a factor of safety was not included. And now at the, and at the city council level is brought to staff's attention that uh, I forget the exact LIP section. I'm sure Jessica could look it up while we're speaking here required that a variance uh, be requ be required because the factor of safety could not be met. And at the time staff had been in this, I believe, I think Jessica is an accurate way to describe it. We had been focused on the building code standards for when, when do you need a factor of safety variance? And the reason for that was that there was a miscommunication between the uh, city geologists, uh, basically the uh, ESD department and the planning department. We had been under the assumption that when it came to factor of safety variances and the nest and the requirements for when those were triggered, we were relying on our geotechnical staff to alert us to that. Unfortunately, what we learned was that a, a previous building official had directed them to utilize the California building code. And it, it was simply a miscommunication between departments. 
uh, that when it was brought to our attention, uh, when this was at the city council on appeal, we looked at it and at that time, uh, we'll let Pat off the hook. It was Trevor that was involved. Uh, Trevor looked at it, Trevor Russin, and he agreed that we had made an error. And yes, the requirements of the LIP had to be met. And so as a result, that's why we're back today. So I think Jessica, is that correct? It's not so much the findings, it's, it's the variance that is the issue. Yes, that's correct. The hazard findings were made in all iterations of the staff report, but I do think what's more pertinent is the variance findings, like you mentioned. So are we determining tonight if we, we do this finding? <laughs> No longer 1.5, it's 1.4. Or what are we determining as as instability? Because I don't see anything in our code that says anything under the 1.5. John, if I could interject, that has been a county policy and never been written down in any code. The county policy is 1.5 and above was safe. Above 1.25 it could be permitted with a variance or with a waiver. But uh, Richard, my question is, this is the county code. We've got the state code, which we've adopted. And then you're telling me that it has nothing to do with the code. It has to do with the LIP. So my my problem here is not this house at all. It's, it's a minor addition. As far as I'm concerned, it's exempt. Okay. Uh, but I don't want to have us make a finding without any basis in fact. We we just say, well, because this says this finding says is subject to instability. Well, we know from the past it was. We don't have anything that says in the future it might not be. And we don't have a number we're basing it on. We're basing it on the appellants. Geologist who is granted an expert in this area saying, well, that's what the county does. But is that what we do? And are we now saying it's 1.4? That's that's my question. I don't I can't make a finding that sets a precedent without knowing what the precedent is. And I don't see how the LIP trumps the building code. Maybe I could ask a question or two that might help clarify John's concern. Um, okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, this, this would be a question for Lauren, who I see in the meeting. Uh, good evening. Um, the staff report at force says, quoting, city <laughs> consultant reviewers have reviewed the project and have determined the proposed project will have no adverse impacts on the area. Um, now, given in, in light of the, in particular, the perched water hypothesis for which there's a lot of evidence and it, it may all be anecdotal but you know we've got the upper slope that's the house dipping down we've got the leakage on inland lane we have the pooling in the basement of both the subject house and the id's house um, and i think there's some other things how can how can city geotechnical consultants have determined the proposed project will have no adverse impacts how, how have you determined that well, can I add a little to that, Craig? Hang on, um, hang on, yeah. Vice Chair Mazet. Uh, yes. Is Miss Doyle is Miss Doyle in the meeting? Can we hear from her, please? Maybe she's stepped out for dinner or something. She's she's about to speak. Okay. Oh, there we go. I, I'm. I am unmuted. The the host is exercising control. <laughs> As they should. Hi. Hello. Okay. Uh, first of all, the city geotechnical reviewers, we are not the consultants or the designers for the project. That is Don Kowaleski and the geotechnical engineer, just to clarify the roles there. Um, no, no. We, no. We don't make those determinations. What they do is they make the they make their findings, and then we review whether what they have presented uh, um, substantiates those findings. Okay, so I would 
like to draw the difference though between anything that is going on with local any local groundwater and i and i hear a lot of it mentioned and i've seen past emails go by i have never seen a comprehensive report or presentation of information a map could be a lot of local conditions going on um but what ever might be going on with any kind of perched water at the surface and if, if in fact there is a perched water table and and you're implying that there is and that it's contiguous and that it covers all these lots and areas that you're that you're mentioning um that doesn't have anything to do with the deeper landslide and the findings of whether the project is subject to it is going to increase the um instability of the site okay well nothing in the code talks about how deep the instability would need to be um whether whether it's part of the big rock overall condition or whether it is something much more local I don't right, which is why Don has the has has uh, the addition on piles. So, right. I, and I understand, but but when we're talking about the variance, we're talking about a larger condition that cannot be mitigated. Uh, anything local, such as any kind of perch water table or loose surficial material that's a foot to, um, you know, maybe even five, even up to 10 feet deep can be mitigated and is a local condition and is not something that would require or engage us in this larger discussion of stability. And okay. if Mike wants to jump in here, please do. And I would also ask that you have your the consultant speak on this. Okay, no, I'm sorry. I, um, I don't see anything in the writing of the resolution that would distinguish that so i don't i you may be well be ah, clear, okay but but here, here's my i think i'm with john in in terms of you just can't make that finding one on hazard that, that it will neither be subject to nor increase instability we, we we don't know and then that that leaves um resolution finding d1 also problematic quote evidence in the record demonstrates that the project will neither be subject to nor increase the instability of the site from blah 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 well, we don't have the evidence that really allows us to say either, um, because we haven't investigated this perch situation clearly. And so, so to me, then we get to that's hanging out there. And then we're saying, well, be that as it may, we want to grant a variance and say, well, we think maybe we're close enough and maybe those things aren't a big deal. And even though we don't know for sure, um, and, but then when we're talking about a variance, we have this whole other layer of discourse that talks about, do we have the evidence of other properties having been granted a, this privilege, such that not granting it here would be a deprivation to the applicants? Or would granting this be a privilege that others don't enjoy, such that this would create a new precedent? And when I was asking Jessica for the other addresses where we've had remodels or expansions, um, since cityhood it, it's a very dry list there with an average of what, what did i say it was 140 something 134 square feet um it, it, to me this when we're talking about variance i don't know that we have the evidence of that privilege or the uh, deprivation stuff that we can really say yeah this is this is a case we can make here so that that's where i come out okay i'm gonna i'm gonna go to Commissioner Wetton, do you have any thoughts on this? You're muted. Thank you. Well, I, you know, I, I also have trouble with the findings of maybe a different finding. I, I'm sympathetic to the downhill neighbor and, uh, you know, finding number two under the variance. The granting of such a variance will not be detrimental to the public interest, safety, health, and welfare, and will not be detrimental or injurious to the property or improvements in the same vicinity, same vicinity and zones in which the property is located. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of good points that have been raised, and uh, I think we we have to be pretty careful in 
making a, uh, you know, granting this variance because I think there's, you know, there's a lot on the line and there's a lot of unknowns. Okay, Commissioner Jennings. Yeah, um, let me go over a few items. I, I struggled with this ever since it came back from the city council. And um, I'm sympathetic with what John was saying because uh, I believe the building code, uh, if applied, would allow the project to go forward without a variance. Uh, but I also recognize Patrick's comments that were they were the planning commission and the planning is controlled by the LIP um, in a different way than the, than the uh, building and safety is controlled by the building code. So there are a lot of factors that play into this. One is that um, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent on this miserable 700 square foot addition. Um, it's been kicked around. I don't think geology was ever the, the issue apparently because it turned out to be one having to do with building height. But um, we have ended up in this debate. And the way I would look at it is this. Even though you cannot say for sure that the structure is not going to have um, any increasing instability or the effect of increasing the instability on the property because we haven't tested that. And I guess the only way you could do that would be to build the building and see whether it was going to have any effect or not. But what we do know is that everything that could be done, everything that we know increases instability has been removed. The adoption of a evapotranspiration system removes, not only avoids an increase resulting from this, but it removes the wastewater that would otherwise previously have been contributed through a septic tank. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, taking the piles down to the, to the uh, I'm sure, sure what the geologic term is, the good earth, the, 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 that will support uh, the structure. Uh, it, it, it also tends to, to improve the situation. Taking the water off of the roofs, it's interesting because in a lot of areas we, we talk about you know, our instinct as well, we, we want to decrease impermeable services, but not here, you want to increase impermeable services and you've, you've put in place a system that will remove more of the water from the property and, and by the impermeable services and direct it down onto the street. Uh, so it, it, there are, even though you can't say, well, we don't know what the, what the result is, every factor that, that can be identified is there. So there's that. The second factor has to do with whether, uh, and, and, and Craig is correct that we have to go through the variance findings that are listed in the, the uh, LIP. And one of them is that, that denying the variance would, um, would deprive him of, the, deprive the applicant of privileges that other people in the, in the area have. And, and I was thinking the same thing. I wonder how many um, permits for remodels have been granted in Big Rock. Uh, Big Rock was a pretty well built out and you know, planned community. Uh, didn't plan for the, for the first. Earth movement. Oh, Siri is talking to me. Um, and uh, so, but, but we did find four. And uh, Craig's point is that, well, they were really small, but that's not relevant to the issue of uh, whether it's going to, whether, it, whether they were built without a factor of safety of, of 1.5. The, the size of the building doesn't matter. It's, it's just a question of, of you know, whether you're adding uh, or decreasing um, uh, the weight on the, uh, on the, uh, the surface. And that, so I, it seems to me that uh, the fact that there have been four built cuts the other way from what Craig says. In, in fact, that people have been given the privilege of building since cityhood 
and that to deny this variance would um, would have the same result. Now, it's a, it's a very difficult um, a very difficult case, but I think when you when you combine all of the factors that have been um, all of the features of the project, which are designed to uh, reduce the danger, and when you combine that with the with the geological reports and the the, the, the evidence from the experts, which say this is not going to increase uh, the hazard, uh, I think that that, in my mind, outweighs outweighs the other problems. And I admit that in this case, I have a certain amount of sympathy for this poor applicant that has been dragged over the coals for I don't know how many years now. Um, it needs to end. And given the fact that we're talking about a 750 foot addition, which is going to add nothing to groundwater, uh, I, I'm willing to go uh, and make the findings necessary to grant the variance. Even though, as I say, I'd, I'd rather be with John and just be able to say, well, the building code allows it, so I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, I, have I have a question to Lauren, if, you, if I could ask. Go ahead. Uh, is she unmuted? She is now. I okay. Now. Uh, my main question is the finding itself. And, and, and Jeff just spoke to that. He's saying, well, we're doing the best we can not to make it worse. But the finding says it is subject to the instability of the area. Not we're making it less instable. It's, is it instable? And you said, well, there's... And I believe you said, well, uh, we can't go down 100 feet and figure it out. So did you make your determination on the fact that it is not making it worse, or did you make it under the fact that this is not an unstable area, which is a defining we have to make? Okay. I didn't make the finding. If you want to see the detailed finding or conclusions that we reviewed with respect to whether it met the the code okay which which the that's section 110.2.3.4 and I know that's not what we're, we're talking about I understand we're talking about the LCP LIP um, so first I just want to correct I wasn't the one that said we can't go down 150 feet I believe that was Don Koleski just to get the record straight okay. so Basically, what we were reviewing for was, did Don, and I believe he did, uh, provide substantiating discussion, evidence that this project would not, one, adversely affect the stability of the Big Rock Mesa landslide nor would it be adversely affected by the instability of the Big Rock Mesa landslide. And there aren't any local slopes either, because when you're talking about stability on the Big Rock Mesa landslide, you have to keep in mind it's the stability as it relates to the larger landslide and then also the stability as it relates to local slopes that the project may affect. So the finding was that the project as proposed would not contribute to instability nor would it be adversely affected by the uh, instability of the Big Rock Mesa landslide because it's not sitting on any local slopes, it's not in any scarp area, it's sitting basically in the middle of the mesa, which uh, so, and so if you, that's, that's how we reviewed it. Um, if Chris Dean were on here, I think he would echo that. Uh, Mike, do you have anything to add? Mike Phipps is here, the engineering geologist who did the presentation on Big Rock Mesa and factors of safety and all that with me at city council in February, 2021. Mike, somebody unmute Mike. 
if he's there. Well, I anyway. did, did I answer like, did I answer your question? Well did, did I answer your question, uh, Commissioner Mazza? Really, because what I'm my my question is we're making a finding that this is not subject to the instability of the big rock landslide. And or anything and everything I've heard at all the hearings I've been to is there is a big rock landslide. It is unstable. It covers a large area, and it's dependent upon the water level. And it's yeah, poten potentially unstable. So I guess I would have to look at the when we do our review. I'm not looking at the specific planning finding as it's written there, and I probably would not word it that way okay well uh, we didn't word it this way either the coastal commission did and so what we so then it, it does depend on how you want to define stability um we when we were reviewing this and and don koleski did address this and that was that that even if the big rock mesa landslide were keeping this lot would be one of the ones that likely would not experience any distress. Well, my, my question would be, I have always been told that the whole thing moves at once, pretty much. No, that is not true. And that is not the way we presented it. And that is not the findings of the Bing Yen uh, report, which is the most comprehensive uh, study to date. Okay, were you given any information that 150 feet down, where the slide meets the plane, that it's stable. Because I don't know of anything that's been dug up in the last 15 years that says it is. And that's basically what we're saying. And the reason why I'm concerned about this. No, I don't, I don't think that's what they're, we're saying. I, I think that it, here's where the, the engineering and the science meet semantics. And I understand your concern with the with the wording of the finding i i do um okay. let me ask you this are do you think there's other areas of the landslide that are less stable than this area i believe that is what the big rock mesa report by bing yen showed is that there are multiple regions and i think i presented a summary of that in the report that we presented to city council in February 2021 when we were asked to comment on the stability of okay. Big Rock Mesa. You would say that it is not unreasonable to limit this finding to this one property then, rather than making it universal because of the way it's basically been presented and the way the finding is made is it's not subject to the landslide. Well, we can say, okay, it's not, this particular lot may not be subject to the landslide, but that's not a, a universal situation. Is that something that you would that say? That is correct. Okay. Th there are different, if that, that is actually the conclusion that the Bing Yen report um, came to. It's why they evaluated all the different regions and had all the different geologic sections and stability analyses and came up with different factors of safety for different regions. So I think how the Big Rock Mesa landslide affects a property is very much dependent on where you are on the landslide. Okay, now if you were reviewing other areas of the, of the landslide, would you ask or some kind of boring or something that told you what the stability factor in that area was? There are areas, in fact, uh, out in the Western Extension, there's a new project proposed, a pool where, uh, where we don't necessarily ask. What we do is we give them the guidelines and tell them they have to, you know, provide substantiating data for whatever conclusions. But if there is a local slope that uh, could affect the uh, property, then yes, we ask them to characterize that slope and run stability analysis on the local slope. 
as well as then comment on the position of the property in the larger slide and how the larger slide affects the property and how the proposed project would affect the Big Rock Mesa landslide. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Jessica, can I ask you a, a question? Um, how do I say it? Uh, is there language that can be put into this finding that says this applies only to this particular lot and and uh, it, is, it is determined by its location and its particular factors so we don't create a problem the reason why i'm saying this is i own property in laguna and about 25 years ago there's a place called Bur uh, uh, big Birdview Canyon or something, um, Bluebird Canyon. Bluebird Canyon. And 25 houses slid down the hill. Three years later, the city let them rebuild. And they and 36 houses slid down the hill. The city lost one whole year's worth of revenue that they had to pay in penalties and had to borrow money from the state to keep in operation. So um these are these are serious things when 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 a planning commission approves something that might be dicey so uh i don't want to create a universal diciness you can lose one house and lose three million dollars but to lose 150 and have to pay for them it's tough so i um is, is that something we could put in here I actually just going to defer to patrick i don't i mean so the, you know my take is that that's kind of already the case these variance findings it's a project case by case basis if if the planning commission and once again I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth if if there is more comfort in the planning commission of inserting kind of in the recitals section saying as has always been the case any findings made in this resolution is specific to this project and this project only any subsequent cases or applications will be judged on their own merits on a case by case basis. That's kind of the standard template from a purely legal standpoint. I understand your guys' desire to want to be consistent and kind of give everyone a fair shake and similar, but if that's something that, 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 that you all want, I, I wouldn't stand in the way, although it may not necessarily be needed. Okay, well, what I'd like to do is make a motion to approve the project as, as uh, described with finding one, putting in your language in the finding and and mentioning also specifically geological stability findings. Um, that's my motion. If you can come up with that language. Which finding, John, specifically? Which, which finding, John? Yeah, that was going to be my question. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm talking about the hazard finding F, F2, where we say it's not subject to uh, the stability of the so so are, are we talking about the, the and, so, and i apologize if i'm looking at the wrong thing and uh planner thompson uh, i see hazards as section c and then the variance of section b is that is that accurate or am i looking at the wrong resolution uh in the staff report right, it's John. section f but in the, in oh, the resolution it's um section like you were saying b and c i'm looking at the staff report because i yeah apologies vice chair sorry hazard findings yeah the, just, we should be discussing wording for the resolution correct correct yeah and, and so yeah right and, and so and, and, and i'm i'm perfectly acceptable with patrick's wording except i would like to add the fact that the the determination of stability is specific for this lot i want to have a geological basis to this so if we do have a big slide, if it rains for the next decade uh, and we can't pump fast enough, the city isn't on the hook for a half a billion dollars. Do I have a second? Can I introduce well, um, Isn't there a waiver? Isn't there a waiver already? Don't, don't they have to, the applicant have to sign a slide waiver or something like that? They, they sign waivers. Part of it. In fact, in the case of Bluebird Canyon, bingo, you're going to court. 
They don't mean squat because the city is the one that's deciding it's okay. But they do not mean it. Vice Chair Mazza, Bluebird Canyon, because I know the area too, that's, we're talking about two different kinds of geology here. And this is a flat lot. And you were talking about a major hillside that all ended up downtown. I know that's um, why I'm making this specific to this lot. All of, all of Big Rock is not flat. But this particular area is pretty flat. I don't want to define the area. I want to define the lot. Okay, that's what I mean. What is the area? I got somebody telling me that it's every house. I meant I meant the lot. I meant the lot. I meant the lot. Yeah, so. Uh, I represented the soils engineer in the Blue Bay, Bluebird Canyon lawsuit. <laughs> well, I hope it's a good fee. <laughs> so anyway, that's my, I'll take uh, any uh, uh, adjustments uh, under consideration if I get a second. I'm, I'm sorry to that the discussion. I'm sorry, did you? you could could somebody read the back, read the uh, uh, motion back, please? I think Mr. Donegan's we're, we're trying to. Go ahead. Sorry, give me one second. So here's what I have right now, and, and Vice Chair Mazza, please. You know, so the findings contained in this resolution are limited to this project alone. These findings, including but not limited to the specific geological findings for this specific property, are not precedential for any future projects. Sounds good to me. Unless Jeff, as a lawyer, wants to make it fancier. Once again, I'm all ears. I, I kind of. Got that on the fly, but I think uh, that adequately captures uh, Vice Chair Maz's direction. I, my hand's been up. For ten minutes. I don't get paid. I, I, I will second it. Okay, Commissioner Hill. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I don't understand how this language works because the next project that wants to do 700, 1,000, 1,200, maybe even 15 in Big Rock will say, hey, you gave, you gave it to those guys. And you said it, it only applied to that one, but how do, how do you limit that? It seems like, and, and back to back to Jeff's point about having called out four already, for, ranging from a hundred or averaging one hundred and thirty-four, biggest one two hundred. I mean, that's barely that's like the size of a shed. I think this is a quantum change to say up to almost eight hundred. So, I, I, to me, by by saying yes to this. We're implicitly saying yes to anybody else on the Hill doing 700, maybe 1,000, maybe more by leaning on this one and saying, well, you said it was only that property, but how, how can you say that? How can that have any legally binding effect? I would ask Patrick that because to me, that's how you limit it to that. And, 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 right, and, and once again, the, the binding effect, it, 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 is, it is not lost on me that that, that is a an, an issue for, for you all. In the land use context, these findings are on a case-by-case -case basis. There's plan, planning commissions turnover. The same exact project could be viewed by five, three different planning commissions. You could get to different results. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm cognizant of the concern about the precedential value, but this is not Supreme Court precedent. This is not like they come and say, you did X, Y, and Z, therefore you must do it. You all or future colleagues or future planning commissioners always retain the, the discretion on a case by case basis. And yeah, so my, my point, Craig, is so the, we don't the, do that. Hang on. We hang on. This normally. Vice Chair Mazza, one minute. Senior Planner Thompson has something. Oh, I, I just wanted to also comment that there was one addition approved at 20247 Pier de Chica that was a 758 square foot addition and just wanted to read that into the record for context of that isn't uh, that 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 was this same lot previously 2005 no there was one at this exact lot and then there was another project at 20247 for the same ex same exact square footage as this was in 2005 yes they're both 758 i thought that had to have been a typo well, we're talking about apples and oranges, Craig. Uh, we are making a geological limitation here. The 125% uh, building code thing is totally different, okay? If somebody comes in and wants to do this on another lot, we're saying you can't point it at this house and say you let them do that. As Lauren said, they have to prove by 
actual testing that their particular lot is just as safe. They and have to do and, something to do that. They can't just say, they got away with it. They did it. So I get to do it. They, and and what we have in the record now, we have in the record now that a 1.4 is that's good enough for a variance. No, so, we don't. No, I don't. So, so we, as as excuse me, yeah, Mr. Sure, Baza, I want to be clear. What we have in the record as of this specific project is that this specific factor of safety is potentially, and because there's been no vote, is potentially qualified for the required findings. I, I totally disagree because the, where we got that number was from the applicant's opinion. And we never said it's 1.4. And Lauren, Lauren, who is reviewing it, never said it's 1.4. An applicant can say anything he wants. He can say the property is purple, so he should approve it. That doesn't mean that's why we approved it. Well, but the point <laughs> is the, the applicant for any next project can say anything they want to, and they can look They back. can, but the, the staff should point to this finding and say the planning commission determined you can't do that. you got to prove it on this one. Okay, yeah. right. Yes, hang sir. on, hang on. Yes. Commissioner, Commissioner Jennings. Well, one other fa thing that is in the record, and that is the fact that the applicant has gone to great lengths to uh, remove and improve the situation that exists on the lot now in terms of getting water, uh, getting the water into the evapotranspiration system, getting the water off the roofs and all of the solid surfaces and getting it out to the street so it can drain. Um, so those are factors that any subsequent Big Rock uh, representative or I'm sorry, applicant would have to consider. Uh, and adopt because otherwise they wouldn't be consistent with the the uh, variance that we've granted. That we may yeah. be granting. Could, could that be encapsulated in the resolutions? That that degree of specificity. <laughs> well, let me let me just point out that we're going two different things. We're finding here. Well, that could cut we're both ways. That, we're finding that it is. We're saying right now it's not subject to, and Jeff is saying yes, and it also does not increase. So we could add some more language saying they must decrease the effort too. But this resolution requires us to say it's not subject to. It doesn't say, oh, if you, you lessen the effect, it's okay. It doesn't say that. So if Jeff, if you'd like to add another sentence or two that says uh, an and, and applicant must uh, prove that he is uh, increased this in, uh, does not, did not increase the instability. Uh, that's fine with me. Uh, it makes it even more specific. But that it's not, that's all in the staff report. We know we know with the new septic. We know with the piles. We know with the roof. As Jeff or Commissioner Jennings just said, that that stuff's all there. It's all it's in the reading. I don't think that needs to be added. I think that um, I think. Right now, I think we've got we've got a, a motion and we have a second. I think there's hang on, Commissioner Hill. Just did you have something, Commissioner Wetton? Uh, no. Okay. So to me, I think we we've, we've got everything. But Commissioner Hill, go ahead. Yeah, I, this is for Patrick. How do you address the, the issue of the non-participant third parties in the assumption of risk and release? I mean, you're talking about a document that between an agreement between the city and the applicant, and then you have, you know, the guy up slope or the people down slope who might be affected by something that happens here. They don't, they don't get to sign off on that. They don't get to be part of that process. What happens if they have an injury that, that is caused by this, hypothetically? Um, they get to sue the city, right? Or, and it, it, so once again, I'm, Yes, the, the, the city is always kind of open and exposed to litigation. This idea of, of requiring waiver and then indemnification from the property owner is, and Director Mollica, I'm sure you would agree with this, is basically project universal. That's that's what, what, what we do. The city, you know, I would, you know, th and that's kind of how we protect ourselves. I'm sure they have homeowners insurance, you know, the city has insurance, et cetera, et cetera. What future injury and what future causes of action may be raised by neighbors downslope against the city, 
Yeah, you're right. They're, they're, it's really difficult and, and they're, they're unknowable. Um, that being said, that's always a risk for any project. Well, but I, of... I guess, no pun intended, but we're on different terrain when it's a sort of a hypothetical case where you, anything could happen to a, a property versus this case where we do have some clear ideas of what could happen and what it is vulnerable to. And so, and, and, and so, I mean, I, you know, and, and, and I guess I would, and I don't want to, I'm going to speak in hypotheticals, I, I, but, you know, if, if the city were to do nothing, let's say this project never came before the, the planning commission, and you're right, the, the kind of the, the worst happened and something happened, you know, from where I sit, people, if, if there was a lack of deep pockets around, people would stare, would, would eventually cast their eyes on the city as well. So I, I understand your concern. It's not lost on me, but but this either thumbs up or thumbs down on this project, wherever it may go, to me is not really dispositive on any city liability and or risk as it pertains to a large, you know, knock on wood, I hope it never happens, landslide or some type of other natural disaster where people start looking around for, for a deep pocket. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna step in here. So. Well, I, I'm looking at I'm looking at Mr. Koloweski, who's one of our more stringent geologists. And when you're talking about, well, if something happens or we're just being blatant about this, we're not. If you, as a general contractor, I've got to carry $2 million of the insurance. My truck's got to carry it. Anytime I get on a job, you have to have this. The people I'm looking at on this screen between Yaroslavsky, the architect, our architects, Don and everybody else, we just don't say things to say things to get them to go. There's some there's some history there. There's you don't stick your neck out on something like this, especially in this neighborhood, and just think it's just oh it's all this and this, Commissioner Hill. That's not that's not it at all. I, I agree with you completely. Not, you're not addressing this, my point. There is so much to this that all everybody here on the screen I'm looking at, including myself. We we really have to, you know, we have to make damn sure we know what we're talking about here. And when you get onto these projects, be it the hillside work I've done throughout the city, it's tricky. And you've got to, you're taking that chance. You're going out there because you know that I've done what I can do. I feel that this is right. If it isn't right, they won't do it. Especially this man I'm looking at on the screen, Mr. Koloweski. He's a tough guy. So if he's feeling that, that on this particular kind of piece of property, as I just mentioned, it's pretty flat, even though there is an elevation change. Um, I think we're in pretty good shape here. So uh, I, I, I'm I'm with everybody else, or Commissioner Jennings and and even Commissioner Maza on this, I, or Vice Chair Maza. I feel that this property isn't going to cause anybody any grief, any any slide or anything else. The up here neighbor neighbor, that's his business. He need, he better go look into something. The downhill Mrs. Idy that, that spoke with this new septic system, they're not going to have these situations. So my suggestion at this point is, I think we have a motion, we have a second. I'll have let you have one more say, or Commissioner Jennings, do you have one more thing? Can I respond directly, please? Go ahead. I agree with virtually everything you just said. And to me, that's just not the point. The point is, if we say yes on this now, then we have several dozen, maybe you know, 50 other houses in Big Rock who can all each go point to this and go, oh, okay, I get my 800 or 1,000 square feet. And then 10, 20 years from now, that's when it slides because we've we've created this precedent that allows for this big incremental change. That's my right. concern. I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing that. I mean, it, 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 when, when Mr. Koleski told us that the, after the Northridge quake that the slide only moved a quarter of an inch, I mean, I, I, you know, these, they're watching this thing. They're, everybody's watching it. The upper head scarf has, scarf has moved several feet since then. So it, 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 there is differential movement in different places. Okay. That's, that's why, that's why Mr. Donegan brought up the point of, and we all know it, it, everything we do is almost a case by case situation in this city, almost always. And they're not all easy. And here we are. This is a case by case instance to me. So. That's that's where I am with it. Hang on. Okay, so I see I see uh, uh, Ms. Doyle had her has her hand up. Go ahead. Can you unmute her, please? Thank you. Okay, we had her. Can we unmute um, her? 
we're working on that, I believe, Alicia. Um, I'm going to click it and if you can help with the unmuting. Am I you. unmuted now? You yes, are. you are. There we go. Um, I'm, I am listening to, com uh, to Commissioner Hill and what I'm hearing is the equating of the size of the development to creating a problem but the factors that affect stability or have an impact on the landslide are water, imp you know, permeable surface and seepage pits, wastewater that Mr. Haney spoke about at the very beginning and, and is well documented as a factor uh, in the original sliding uh, that occurred. So I don't think you can take size of addition and equate that to creating a problem or adversely impacting the slide. And well, I maybe, didn't maybe. want there to be that false equivalent there. Well, maybe. So so I maybe, just wanted to. Anyway, that's it. So maybe the the solution is to be very specific about the increase in number of fixture units, and say. You know, this the precedent to the extent that there will always be somebody will find a way to find a precedent. How, what is the exact increase in the fixture units on this one, Jessica? Do you know offhand? It's something like, I don't know, 10 or I don't know offhand, but I can look at the environmental review. The, 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 the argument to that, Commissioner Hill, is this these systems are so much more efficient. I mean, we have setback rules and we've had them. We had one over on sea level, we've had, yeah. we've had a couple of them where. The, the, the units are so efficient that that 100 foot setback can now be 75 feet. You can gain it because you're not having you're, it not coming out of the, out of the tank like it used to. This stuff is is so much different. So I, I don't know about that. I, I think if somebody ends up wanting to build anywhere where that's going to be an issue that they're going to have to go to this system to to get by to build what they want. Well, she does. I mean, she does make a good point, but it, it is a slippery slope. It's you know, it's like what? Okay, one one just one thing, Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Mazin, and I think we should because it's getting late. I should be very time short. for us to take a break. I know I can use one. Go ahead. Very short. We, as far as I'm concerned, we done what we can to make this specific to this property. How many fixtures they have? How big it is? Everything else is for another planning commission. But they have to look at this as not being a president. And we always talk about making things worse. This finding is also existing condition of the landslide. You cannot build if it's unstable. You have to prove that. So I think we've done the best we can do. I'd like to call a question. I agree. Let's take, can we take a roll here, please? Yes. Um... I hesitate to do this, but as a point of clarification, Patrick, could you tell me which section you would be adding that amendment to? Oh. I think Gosh. Jessica knows the most because it's. I was taking it from the resolution. Or from I'm the, I'm seeing language that about the variance being only granted for site specific conditions on the subject property and shall not be determined to be precedent setting in section B three. I don't know if you're adding it in an additional spot. So once again, it's a commissioner, excuse me, Vice Chair Mazza. I, I feel like we could put it in a few different areas. We could one put it in the recital, the recital section. That would kind of set the tone for the overarching. Um, as as noted, we already have that kind of genuflection to that in the variant section, which as you said is in B3, or we could put it in section, I would say maybe in the hazard section, which is section C. So as the motion maker, I would kind of defer to you where, where you think uh, it is best. Uh, Jessica mentioned the section. I, I was in the hazard section. I don't mind putting in all three if you want, but I, I definitely want it in the hazard section. And I think that C, it was F something in, in the- Okay, that would be section C in the resolution. Section C. So and so we'll 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 add that to as a new sec. Excuse me, a new finding section C six. Thank you very much. Um, and then why would it not be in C one where I, where it's talking about the very same thing? I mean, we 
once again, I, we could put it there. So if you want to add it to the end of C1, that, that works as well. Once again, the, the, the text of the additional is, is resolution wide. It doesn't specifically say it only applies to this section C1. But well, I'll, it, defer to, I'll defer to your opinion on where it is most effective to where it's very plain to future uh, planning commissions and staff and geological reviewers that it is site specific and new sites must do their own. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Move it on. Vice yes. Chair Maza. Yes. Yes. Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Commissioner Hill. You're muted. And can you can I pass and go around? Sure. Um, okay. Commissioner Wetton? No. Chair Smith? Yes. Commissioner Hill? No. Motion carries. I'm, I move we have a break. It's take a break. And how long would you like to recess the meeting for? Uh, seven, eight minutes. Seven minutes. Come back at 930. Is that enough? Yep. Yep. Okay. Right, thank third. you.
Testing. Can you hear me? Dad? I can. Okay. I just didn't know whether my phone was still working. Oh, you're good. I like that background you got on behind you. Yeah, well, I, I was tired of looking at the lights in my office. It was giving me a headache, so I had to choose something. Yeah. Oh, we got a lot of people still. Oh, where'd that go? Ooh, where am I? No. Hmm? Okay. Well, Jerry Smith, I have nine twenty nine on mine. I just want to make sure we don't start too early in case someone yes, sir. took a look. I like the new background, Commissioner Jennings. Who's that at the Golden Gate Bridge? There we are. Yes. Hi. Everybody looks much happier. <laughs> Go for Commissioner Hill on his back. I understand that one. Yeah, that's a bummer. I get that. Yeah, I guess I, I think a lot of us do. I'm getting patches.
Unless I was just not observant earlier, Commissioner Jennings has moved to a very dramatic location. <laughs> These buddies with Elon Musk. <laughs> I haven't gone through the avatars where I can put the mouse ears on and the rest of that. I am sure there will someday come a meeting that I show up with that on because at our planning staff meetings, we tend to do that quite often. Ah, here we go. There we go. Okay. Sorry, well, my, I my do back not, is... I'm glad you're back and safe. Uh, well, well I do not have a gavel. Me. I do have my planning <laughs> hammer and when I was in running and siding back in 1982. And I will start the meeting. Okay, we are on to 4B, and this is Coastal Development Permit Number 21-009 and Demolition Permit 22-015, an application for an interior and exterior remodel and additions to an existing beachfront, single-family residence, and other associated development. This was continued from September 19, 2022. Staff report, please. Good evening, Chair Smith and members of the Planning Commission. The item you have before you tonight is for Coastal Development Permit Number 21009, including Demolition Permit Number 2215. This is for the project located at 23936 Malibu Road. Next slide, please. This slide um, demonstrates a vicinity map and aerial photograph of the project site, which has a red star on it. The project site is located on Malibu Road on the beach side and is surrounded by residential development. Next slide, please. The project includes an interior and exterior remodel of an existing 4,944 square foot two-story single family residence, including an addition of 2,253 square feet, an open air trellis, ground floor and second floor decks, new view permeable fencing, 126 cubic yards of non-exempt grading, a new OWTS and including demolition permit number 2215 for the demolition of exterior walls. Next slide, please. Pictured here is the project site plan, which can show you an overview of the new proposed addition, which is shaded in a red color. Next slide, please. Here have I included some uh, Portions of the demolition plan, um, which include a total demolition of 36%, which is compliant with our city's remodel policy, as well as was approved by our building and safety department. Next slide, please. Pictured here is our first floor plan. Um, the area, again, of the additions are outlined in red. As you can see, those additions are within the existing building string lines and are compliant as such. Next slide, please. Pictured here are the second floor additions, again, outlined in red. Um, essentially, the project is proposing to, to make a single family residence where there was an existing guest house that will be eliminated. You can see it's now gonna become a bedroom. Next slide, please. Pictured here are the elevations for the proposed development. Um, the top elevation here shows the proposed front um, elevation. Um, the bottom elevation shows the proposed right side of the residence. The residence will measure um, a height of 24 feet for a flat roof. Next slide, please. Pictured here are the rear or the beach side elevations um, to the south. And the lower one is proposed left side elevation of the residence. Next slide, please. Here are the story pole photographs. Um, the photographs to the left-hand side of the slide are taken from Malibu Road, the street side um, facing south. The photos on the right are taken from the beach side and um, facing north. You can see um, slightly from these photos, the comparable height to the surrounding residents. Next slide, please. 
This concludes my presentation. Um, in summary, staff recommends the adoption of resolution 2231, approving coastal development permit number 21009, inclusive of demolition permit number 2215. This concludes staff's presentation. Staff and the applicant team are available for any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we have the applicants. Would you like to take disclosures before we open the Oh yeah, the sorry, meant, meant to do that, very sorry. Uh, Commission, or Vice Chair Maza? None. Commissioner <laughs> West? I, I spoke with the architect about a week ago. Uh, nothing was discussed, uh, nothing that is not in the staff report. Commissioner Hill. Yeah, um, well, first, let me just say my back is killing me, so I might just stand up and kind of pace around here, but I, I am in the room. Okay. Um, my, uh, yeah, uh, I saw a six-year-old real estate video on YouTube that does show a concrete path to the beach, contrary to the representation in the biology review. Um, and I also drove by the side and looked at the front and saw that the view corridors are currently blocked by mature palm trees. That's it. Commissioner Jennings? Uh, none except for the letters that came in this week from um, both sides uh, raising issues, several issues, but all of which are now part of the public record. I um, met with the owner and the architect, had a great visit with them, and, um, you know, knowing that this is a, uh, the owner wanting to spend more time here. He wants to make this his, his full-time home um, with his family. And I think that's really important for all of us. We need, we need people that move here all the time. And so, uh, yes, I had a great visit with them and, and didn't learn anything different than what's, what we already have. So um, with that, we can start with the applicants. Representing the applicant team this evening, we have Farshad Alzarnoush. Uh, Mike and Hania Amar, the owners, Fred Gaines, their attorney, and John Yaroslavsky, a uh, professional engineer. Okay. You guys are open to show us what we've got. So if you could unmute Farshad. Thank you. I did. I did. Can you, can everyone hear me? We yes. can. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Yes, hi. Thank you, commissioners, for staying up so late and listening to our boring stories. <laughs> uh, just wanted to, uh, I think the presentation uh, that Jessica provided uh, goes and explains the project. I just wanted to add a couple of things and then ask Comm Commissioner Hill. I don't know what that hit the reference to the path to the beach biology, I don't know what that is, but so we'll deal with that later. This is a uh, uh, two-story existing house uh, with, a, with a detached garage and uh, guest quarter uh, being, com uh, being combined to one house, lowering the, the use, the intensity. And uh, we thought that we could uh, simplify the project with straight lines and more simpler statements, just work with the material for articulation. And uh, it complies with all the 50% rules as far as the square footage is concerned and as far as the uh, exterior wall demolition is concerned as reviewed by planning department and building department approved by building department. I think that just want to put emphasis on the fact that the owners are trying to do this so that this can become a, their permanent home. And that's why we are here. I will reserve my time for the rebuttal. If, if Fred uh, wants to have an opening statement by all means. Okay. Mr. Gaines, do you want to speak? Oh, 
we'll save our time for rebuttal. We, uh, it's a pretty straightforward remodel uh, of the house. We've gone through detail with planning on all the 50% rules to stay within the uh, the rules. Um, the view corridors will be uh, left uh, in the same condition, except they're going to be improved with uh, by by opening up the gates, which currently are solid. They're going to become uh, more transparent, so there's a, actually an, an advantage to the view corridors there. And uh, there's there's no variance here. It's a straight follow the rules um, remodel. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um... And we'll save the rest of our time, please. All right, Thank you. Good. And you'll have 12 minutes and 35 seconds for rebuttal. I'm just noting that very quickly. And um, then we'll open to the public speakers right. who have signed up in advance for the meeting. Uh, if you are present in the meeting and wish to speak uh, on an, this particular item, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of the screen. We're going to begin with Sina Samini followed by Carlo Brandon Gordon. Hello, this is Sina Samimi. Can everyone hear me? We yes. can, thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the westerly neighbor of the property, David Sheehan and Linda, she sorry, David and Linda Shaheen. Um, we already submitted a comment letter on October 12th. I believe that has been distributed to the planning commissioners already. Uh, I'm only going to, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I just want to briefly touch on three of the main points. And I'll, I'll start by saying that uh, my clients are not interested in stopping the remodel project. They just want to, they just want to make sure that the remodel is done pursuant to the code. Um, and so there's, there's a few issues that have been raised here. One is that the the fifty percent rebuild rule. It doesn't appear that those calculations are um, correct in the plans. Uh, the reason for that is because when you're changing the the entire roof line of the entire property, um, those walls that connect to that roof line are also going to be affected. So the entire second floor of this property is going to be um, basically revised so that should go go into the the 50 percent calculation and that's how we analyzed it and that's why we think and we, we we provided some some additional detail there in our letter um secondly and this one's the the, the most easily uh verifiable through just looking at the plans and looking at the math um the the view corridors uh are just not calculated correctly and the, the reason for that is that they did not take the, the correct frontage, linear footage of the, of the frontage. And that's what's required by LIP section 6.5. And so when you look at the survey, the actual width of the property uh, is 56.21 uh, linear square feet. And then when you do the calculations based off of that, and it's all outlined in our letter, but the, there's uh, six feet that, that are missing from the view corridors there, uh, the way that they've done it. And then finally, there are documents that we uncovered from uh, the history of the project when it was first, uh, not when it was first built, but when uh, one of the uh, previous septic analyses was done. And we have the wastewater management program on-site wastewater treatment system operating permits from 2015 and from 2017. And what happened was the, in 2015, this was a four bedroom house and it only had 47 fixtures, plumbing fixtures. At some point there was an unpermitted increase of an additional room and, a, and, a, and 15 additional plumbing fixtures. And due to uh, the, the city's prohibition on uh, expanding the on-site wastewater treatment systems this expansion uh and uh, having the additional rooms isn't going to work and it's going to the project is going to have to be built with those four bedrooms and 47 plumbing fixtures uh that were originally approved uh prior to those new regulations taking effect thank you um, and we are at time okay our next speaker will be carlo brandon gordon followed by Howard Rudsky. 
thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me? We can. Great. Uh, first of all, I am. Um, we've been in Malibu for over 20 years. We absolutely support the beautification of our beautiful town. Uh, the design looks very attractive. Um, I, I'm here tonight um, mainly because my concerns are one of um, planning that may not be completely uh, detailed in its uh, correct measurements. Um, I have a feeling that um, the presentation uh, doesn't reflect the scope of the job. Uh, earlier in uh, another situation, and one of the uh, members was talking about how any homeowner can say that they're going to do something, but it doesn't mean that they will. I think that is appropriate here, uh, mainly because we've had instances of um, changes to the property that um, are uh, self-done. I, I, for example, there is an opening to the beach, uh, a new access to the beach on my side of the property that I'm pretty sure was not um, permitted. And uh, while I completely support updating the property, we have done so over the last 20 years, always according to code. My concern is that I want to make sure that this job is not only reported accurately, but it is um, viewed and inspected so that we aren't, as a community, uh, being told that one thing is going to be done, but really there are plans for completely different size structures. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Howard Rutsky. Mr. Rutsky, go ahead. Good evening, Chair and Planning Commission. Here's a project where, in my opinion, the applicant did everything right. They tried to be friendly and talk and work with their neighbors as human beings from the day they owned the property. But it takes two to tango, as they say. They used an architect and consultants that knew Malibu codes, worked here for many years, and followed them. They designed a home within our codes. They double and triple checked with staff to make sure they complied with all our codes. They and their family are going to live here, in this home, be part of our community on a daily basis, something we all want and should happen more often. They did everything an applicant should do. Please grant them the permit. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll now return to the applicant team for any rebuttal comment that they wish to provide. And if you give me just a moment, I'll reset your clock. Oh, no, I'm going to. Uh, can everyone hear me? We can. Yes. Can we put my uh, PowerPoint, our PowerPoint up? <laughs> this is how I would like to do it if, if you guys agree. Go through the PowerPoint presentation and address uh, three items, actually two items, the 50% and the view corridor, and then let John of Ensuto address the septic. I don't know enough about the septic to intelligently discuss that. Uh, and then I'll ask Mike, the owner, to, if needed, to deal, to respond to um, Mr. Gordon's comment about the path to the beach. That I leave them to. We are not altering that. As far as I know, that is all being permitted. And that's and in, the, in the plans, there is no change there. So um, you've seen the house. Here is the house. Next, please. And I'm going to, uh, these are, I, I don't know if the commissioners have received my uh, response to the opposition and if they have read that or I should go over it quickly. You, you have the floor. It's your your time. The, so the correspondence was sent to the commissioners. Yes, they were. But I'm going to go uh, over them in relation to uh, the 
uh, Mr. Samimi's comments. Mr. Samimi comes out and says that the 50 percent hasn't been may not have been calculated correctly. To us, it has been calculated correctly. Uh, the planning department had checked it multiple, multiple <coughs> line, multiple times, and unless they tell me and the planning department what was calculated wrong, I don't know how to deal with it. And I will show you as we can we go back and for let's go uh, to uh, sheet uh, number. Uh, It's it's your on the on the PowerPoint is uh, page thirteen. It's sheet A three hundred one. Further, sheet A three hundred one at the bottom. Rebecca, Alicia is controlling our slides oh, this Alicia, evening sorry. and. It may take just a moment. Should I give you perhaps you could begin to speak to it as she okay. navigates is the slide? Is it easier for me to refer to the page number in the PowerPoint or to the sheet number? Sorry, we're um, having some technical difficulty. It's um, we, we're restarting the system for a little bit. Okay, so, I'll I'll pause the clock. Thank okay. you so much. So uh, if if the commissioners can look at our page A three hundred one. It, there is a comprehensive analysis done. The red lines are demolished, and there is three charts on upper right side of the uh, page, with those demolished portions being uh, indicated on the elevations. And that's what we've done. We've checked it. Our structure engineer has checked it. The planning department has checked it. And the building department has approved the framing plan that goes with that, uh, as indicated in your package. So I don't know how to deal with that. So unless someone tells me that I said two times two is five, then the fact that we said two times two is two is remains the same. Next, uh, they're talking about view corridor. The what the the definition of building the lot width and frontage is different. The view corridor is defined based on lot width, which you go halfway between front and the rear and draw a perpendicular line and the light line and the lot width at that point is 49 and a half. And that we have done. And Alicia, whenever you're ready, I'll refer you to that sheet. And But the fact of the matter is, Oh, Alicia is displaying sheet A301 at the moment. Okay, so this was what I was talking about. Look at all these red lines, which indicates the, the so-called demolished area and uh, the charts above. And the, to be exact, uh, Mr. Samimi, policy number three says that the top plates, if the top plates are demolished or moved. We are keeping every single top plate, except where it's red, in the same place. The way we are getting that flat roof is by adding uh, a portion of like a little pony call, call wall or beam on top of it. That is the definition policy tree interpretation. That's what I we ad ad adhere to. And that is what the planning and building department has thoroughly, they have looked at it and approved. So we are not, sir, removing the top plates. And we are in total compliance with uh, policy number three. Now, the, uh, the view corridor, if I can look at the site plan, Alicia, page number, your, um, your number nine. And I would like to leave maybe five minutes uh, for uh, Mr. Gaines. Oh, actually, I'm going to have John speak after this. See, this existing front garage where it's indicated white, 
the front setback on the right side is 5.1 and where the garage ends that square is 4.7 we already have a very restricted uh, view corridor uh, the gate on that side yard is a, and the wall on the side yard is a solid wall plus the landscape that it was referred to so at this point there is no uh, line of sight or view corridor we are eliminating or replacing that gate with view permeable um, element glass and then when we go and, and in the rear the fire the, there is a fireplace box out about seven eight foot wide that is about seven feet from away from the property line which we are making five to five point six at this point i would like to let john speak to uh the septic aspect of the project. John? So Alicia, that would be John Yaroslavsky. Correct, sorry. Hello, can you hear me? You can. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, so the letter from the, um, that we received actually was quoting a different section of the policy for the um, prohibition. We're actually in phase three, and this is a developed property. In phase three on a developed property, you are allowed to increase your flow, but you can't go over 420 gallons per day. It's in the section, phase three section residential. I think it's the second bullet. And um, we actually started out with a six bedroom house because before the policy change, when we first started this project, um, we could do the calculation in a different way. Um, in order to clarify that, the city limited the flow to 420 gallons per day, on, um, and uh, which would mean a maximum of five bedrooms. And that's what we have on this project. Okay, great, thank you. And are there any other members of the applicant team that you'd like to have present at this time? Or have you concluded? Mr. Gaines, do you want to come back for anything? I'm seeing two raised hands. I'm trying to, <laughs> I can only see a few people at a time. So I'm trying to scroll quickly. Uh, could you open Atelier Architects, please? We have Prashad. Uh, Mike, the owner, is uh, going to talk to uh, the aspect of the project that Mr. Gordon. Yeah. Talked. So, so one um, minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good evening, everybody. Um, this is Mike Amar. I'm the owner of the property. I've owned the property since 2017, and uh, we love it. And we intend, me and my wife, Hania, and our family to live at the property full time once the renovation is done. Um, as far as the, my neighbor, Andy Gordon, um, thank you for your comments. We plan to stay within code. Uh, we're very reputable people, and we don't exceed policy on anything um, in life. Now, the changes to the property line that we're talking about, uh, I'm sorry, the changes of the access to the beach um, uh, on, the, on, on your side, on the east side, is legal. The city and the county, uh, when it, it has documents from 1984, with illegal uh, steps to the beach on, on, on that side toward your property. That's 100% legal. And uh, the city and the planning have a copy of that. So um, I'll be happy to show you that at any time. Um, I have a stamp copy and uh, it's a legal copy that I got from the county and from the seller when he gave it to me when he built the house. So those are my comments. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I, I would reserve and I hope you can add a little bit time because of the delay and answering to the questions. Do you have somebody else who would like to speak at this time? Fred Gaines has his hand up. Could you unmute Fred Gaines, please? Hello, Honorable Commissioners. Thank you so much for uh, hearing this matter tonight. This is exactly what you want an applicant to do. They they literally <laughs> said to their team, design 
something that requires no variance that meets all requirements. They work very carefully uh, uh, to do that. They did not have a land use attorney involved in this. I was not involved until they got this letter last week from the neighbor's attorney that sort of surprised them. And when we went through it, uh, and we're very happy tonight to hear that that both neighbors on both sides don't want to stop the project. They have certain concerns, but they want uh, they want the, pro the the owner to be able to to remodel this house. But the letter that we did get is just it, it, it contains a misunderstanding of the code. The fact that the roof is being changed does not kick you into the fifty percent. It's exterior walls. The the code is very clear. And they've been very careful to keep it under 50%. In fact, it's about 36% of replacement of, ex of exterior walls. The width of the frontage is the, the issue with regard to the view corridors has to do with the width of the lot, not the length of the frontage. Those are two separate terms in the, in the code. It's been very carefully calculated here, double checked, triple checked. And because we're not over 50 feet in width of lot, these other requirements do not apply. And with regard to the on-site waste treatment, as you heard from John, very carefully gone through the, the letter can, it says we're in phase two, we're actually in phase three, but the bottom line is you're allowed five bathrooms and 420 gallons. And that and the project was designed exactly uh, to those requirements. So uh, we uh, this applicant's really tried to bring you a project that meets all code requirements, uh, doesn't ask for anything out of the ordinary. It's a two-story house, it's gonna modern up this this house um, very consistently with what you've seen uh, along uh, that's been approved on many other lots in the city. And we ask for your um, for your approval. Thank you so much for taking the time to hear the case tonight. Thank you. And that concludes the public. Well, let me see. I've got three participants raising hands. I'm having difficulty seeing the entire group. Um, if you've already spoken, if you could please lower your hand, we can't reopen to you. Okay, back back to us here. I um, believe so if you'd like to conclude the public hearing. Oh, that concludes the public hearing and back to the table with the commission. Um, I see Commissioner Hill has his hand up first, so go ahead. Yay. Um, yeah, I, I have several questions, but I guess sort of a threshold question is the, uh, the area. I, I completely accept that the demolition is that's the, that's appropriate numbers, those are fine. But you also have to be less than 150% of the existing TDSF. And I don't see how we know that because TDSF is not mentioned anywhere in the staff report. And um, the area numbers on the plans are ref and, and, and tables are referencing quote habitable area, which is, you know, that's the interior space versus the TDSF being including the envelope and so forth. So because these are odd shapes and it's not easy to just do a calculation, how, how can we be certain that the addition is not uh, greater than 50% of the area of the TDSF? And I, this, I did ask staff this question in advance and I, I'd hoped for some kind of answer, but I guess it was maybe too late. Are you asking someone I'm asking right staff. now? Yeah, staff. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the the total. Um, let me just pull up the numbers real quick. Is the, all the, the numbers? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, the total numbers here we have is four thousand nine hundred and forty four square feet of total area, with a okay. two. Sorry, two thousand two hundred and fifty three square foot proposed addition. Those are listed as habitable area, such as they were incorrectly specified. Yeah, I believe that was labeled wrong, but let me go back and look on the plans. I mean, you know, chances are that the TDSF would also comply, but again, because it's an odd shape, I, I don't know, you know, we're relatively close to that margin, so. So. TDSF is the total development square footage limitation. And the, the code states that beachfront properties are exempt from that limitation. How you count square footage, how you count square footage for the code is from exterior wall to exterior wall and 
covered space. So whether you're on the beach or not on the beach, uh, the square footage is still counted the same. Right. So I'm, I believe that the table, Jessica, correct me if I'm wrong, but on page six of your report, you identify the house as 4,944 square feet. Uh, I think perhaps an easier way to, I think, make this for folks would have been maybe if we would have divided that in half and shown uh, the the math, so to speak, <laughs> to show that the 7,000, uh, to show that the 7,197 is no more than 50% uh, addition. I think well, that's... I'm sorry. My question, though, then is, it's it's square feet total, including walls. Like, it, it's comparable to TDSF. We're, we maybe don't use that label, but we're not just talking about habitable habitable areas, right? In, in the yes, in planning, we look at for this purpose. It's not commercial. We're looking at anything that has a, a roof over it, and that would include the garages, walls, uh, either walls, yeah, or if they had a. A water, I don't know if they do on this one or not, but a water heater closet, <laughs> uh, like a closet, you know, access from the outside of the house, but it's still under the roof line. So I, I, I guess Jessica is suggesting that this was mislabeled throughout as habitable when in fact we're talking about the, the total area. Yeah, I think we should refer to it as building area. Okay. So that was just a mistaken label. Yes. Okay. We can work to be more clear. Okay. I, I have other questions too. I just thought that was a threshold one. If, if other people want to jump in and you can come back to me, that's fine either way. Whatever you like, uh, Dennis. Well, if, you, if you've got them, go ahead and tell okay. us. Okay. All right. Um, this is for staff. What, what, uh, the, the entire two-story addition is located in the FEMA flood zone. What is the significance of that on this now? I mean, well, let me step back and say a bigger question is the grandfathering issue. Some of these points, I'm not sure whether they get grandfathered because we're under the 150% or and what points are, are not subject to grandfathering. For example, the view corridor. Do we not have to worry about anything about the view corridor because we're not over 150% or we have to worry about that regardless? So you uh, view, it's not that you don't have to worry about the view corridor. There is one, uh, Jessica, correct me if I'm wrong, but the CDP that approved the house, um, it has view corridors. Uh, in terms of, do they have to meet and those view corridor com, uh, requirements um, precede our LIP? Uh, the question of, do the view corridor requirements of this LIP apply? And since they're under, uh, they're not going above a 50% addition, they are grandfathered grandfathered in terms of setbacks. That's uh, chapter six of the LIP. Uh, and a uh, view view corridors, uh, sorry, sorry, chapter six is scenic. View corridor requirements are in chapter six. Uh, there is an exemption there where if you don't go beyond that 50% limit, or trigger a new structure that essentially uh, you can maintain the whatever it is you have now as a setback and a view corridor is a setback. So they are able to maintain the non-conforming situation uh, unless they go over 50% or if the or if the commission tonight determines that this is not a remodel and in fact it constitutes a replacement structure uh, oh. because that would definitely it, it, if this commission believes this to be a replacement structure, uh, then you would definitely need to bring it into compliance with all setbacks, um, string lines. I, uh, I'm just throwing them out here. I'm not saying they're out of compliance, uh, yeah. but if it's a replacement structure, string lines kick in, front yard setback, the side yards, which would include the view corridor. Well, okay, so two things on the view corridor. So you're saying that 6.5 E2A um is not uh, specifically quote building shall not occupy more than 80 percent maximum of the lineal frontage of the site so it's not that it's not the lot width it's specifically the lineal frontage 
in which case the opponents would be correct that the view corridors are not wide enough here. But I think I hear you saying that th that we we live with the existing width of the specified view corridors, unless we decided somehow the whole project is a, a new new over 150. Is that right? Uh, yes, that is. Um... I'm trying to find the exact section. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read and talk at the same time. Um, but that is correct. There is an exemption. Uh, the city has used it before. Uh, in fact, last week, uh, when we were looking at a house on uh, the commission approved on Big Rock Beach, where they did a remodel, kept it under 50%, and then that way they would not have to comply with view corridors. Okay. So now, so they'd be allowed to keep the view quarter they have, which sort of perversely they, they don't have because of the, the palm trees and, and gate and so forth. But uh, how do we handle this where in fact, by putting the glass in the view quarters and making them actual functional view quarters, they are nonetheless at the same time narrowing the one on the Western side because, and you, if, you can see it most easily maybe on A101, A101, which is the the fire. So it's got the red lines around the around the structure. If you look at that one, out at the ocean side of the house, they're expanding the width of the structure by a couple feet there. Which, if you were standing back on the street looking down the view corridor, on the west side of the view corridor your view to the east side of the view corridor would be narrowed. So I guess one question is, is there anything that says the view corridor has to be comprised of parallel lines? Or if the opening where you see the view is narrow at the street, but the view corridor widens out as it approaches the beach, that whole thing is the view corridor, right? So any encroachment into that widened zone would be a narrowing of the corridor. Am I, am I over talking? Am I making that clear? I believe I understand your question. Jessica, do you happen to have the, the Coastal Commission approved view corridors, the, the, the size? Um, let me pull them up. Yeah. And so when you're looking at this map here, the, the blue area of the new section, see how it ex extends out on the bottom side, the west side. So that if you were standing on the bottom side of the looking down the view quarter, it would actually be appear to be narrower in the new version versus the existing. And I, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know how, if that's relevant or not. But sure. yeah. Well, Go you've got you got to have five feet for the fire department. I'm not sure how much you're trying to gain here. Well, you got yeah, you got to have the five feet, and you've got it all along except for the four point nine seven in that one little spot. But what what you've done out at the ocean side is change the view corridor for, from something like eight or ten feet down to about the five feet. So maybe it's not three feet difference; it's a couple feet narrower in the new version versus the existing. The Coastal Commission should have identified it. Typically. If it's a five foot setback, then it's five. It, it, it follows the, um, the the proper the side yard property line. So what I've seen, if for better or for worse, are, are view corridors that are almost at a run at an angle, uh, and it's all, you almost have to be at that same angle in front to be able to enjoy the benefits. I guess you could say right. of that, that that view corridor if you're perpendicular to the house, you may not get the full benefit. So that's why I'd like to make certain that if, so if they said it's five feet, then we should make certain that this addition honors that parallel, it runs, run a line parallel to the property line. Well, it, and it, it, it does look like it is five or virtually five, but the question is if the pre-existing house uh, allowed a corridor currently out on the beach side that might be seven or eight feet wide, We'd be narrowing that a few feet, and that would, that would, you know, for somebody standing out on the uh, street side, that would effectively narrow their view. I I understand. I think what we're going to find here, and I don't like to make an assumption, but I see that the existing building was approved with a four foot 
setback. And if that is correct, uh, four feet would be the view corridor on that side. I understand the commission's point. And, I, and Pat, I think the code here, my interpretation of the code with maintaining existing would be a four foot view corridor. But once again, if the it is the commission's discretion, if they believe that it would be better uh, to trim that and maintain it at what they believe to be an intent, that that's within their commission's purview. Correct? Right, yes. So that is something, uh, Commissioner Hill, if you feel, uh, you know, if, you know, while the Coastal Commission have only requested or required four feet, if if the commission's wish is that it, it the line of sight there, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm trying to word it the way you are. If yeah. you want to maintain that view, uh, the, it's definitely within the commission's discretion. Does anybody not understand what I'm talking about? Well, I, I think the, to me, the big question is, uh, first of all, across the street, there's absolutely nothing. So you're not blocking any kind of a view. I worked on building the tow yard there and I was in that neighborhood for three years and watched people walk up and down the road. And they're not looking between those houses like that. And there's a brand new beach access just down the street from this house where people will actually go to the beach and have all the view that they want. While I understand this is this is an important thing, but you also have a house that's already there, and you're not you're not looking at anything when you go down the street here. The whole street, the houses are next to each other. There's nothing to look at. The, your best chance of a view is that the beach access down the street to the west. And to me, this is you know they're gonna they're putting glass on the doors. They're making it a little bit nicer. So if you Someone is walking by, they can look, but you know, I've, I've watched the characteristics of this neighborhood for a long time and that peeking down through the sides, there isn't it, even though these folks are trying to do their best to make that better. Well, I, I, I agree with what you, all that you just said. It's just a question of whether we'd be going against the code by effectively allowing them to narrow from the existing to, uh, yeah, so. Um, all right, I might have another question or two, but I should let somebody else go. All right, Commissioner or Vice Chair Maza. Yeah, I, if you could put up that same slide. Uh, um, I have a question that will make it easier with that one. Uh, the blue area <clears throat> is identified as area of addition. And when you do uh, the calculation for uh, Demolition, whenever you cover up an existing wall, that's that's counted. You can't take one wall and put another wall in front of it and say it's not demolished. Okay, so, and when I look at that, and I look at A103, it's not counted. So there's a, a huge section of both floors, the, the purple section along the existing house that should be counted. And this is standard policy we've had forever. Um, I don't know how to calculate that right on the fly, but it seems like when you look at you look at A103, the red dots are the uh, apparently how they calculated it. And really it should be wherever there is any blue that's touching the existing house, plus the windows and doors that they noticed on the, I guess, south side. Um, Can I, inter in, I, I didn't get an A103. I didn't either, I was just gonna say that. Thank I'm you. sorry, A301. I knew it. He's dyslexic as I go. He's dyslexic. <laughs> so if you look at this and then you look at A301, you'll see that none of that was counted. Um, and it's it's quite a bit of distance. I don't know if it's 13 or 17 percent or whatever the distance is, but it's quite a bit. And I think that's an undisputed way we calculate it. It's in our manual. Um, so that's one question I don't know how to address because we might be over 50 percent. Um, well, but John, it, uh, on that A301, E first floor. Right? Is that what you're looking at? Oh, first and second. Okay. 
well, and, and right in the middle of the floor, it says perimeter 251.3, demolished 104.64. Now, where are you looking? Right in the middle of the floor of the structure. Yes, but the red lines are what they're counting. See around the front and the side? I do, but you're, you're, you, now if you're, you're, implying, at, you're implying that they did the math wrong. No, I'm implying they did the method wrong. If you put a wall in front of a wall, it's considered demolition. They're not doing that. They're putting the wall on top. They're adding some height to the wall. To uh, it's first and second floor, if I'm not correct. You're right. You're not correct. Well, why am I not correct? Do we have a first floor? What am I missing here? All of the thing that's pink in this diagram and purple on the one I'm looking at, A101, no, it's A301, okay? You have A301.1, got to go back one, okay? A301 versus A101. A301 will show you what is calculated for the linear feet. Well, 101 is the fire access. So what? Yes, but it shows the new addition. It's the only the one I can find. It's in color. Correct. Okay, if you look at whatever one you want to put up there first, A101, everything in purple is new building. And it is outside the perimeter of the old building. Okay, so everything where it says the existing two-story building that's white, Everything that's blue that touches that is exterior demolition by definition because a wall was put, put in front of it. It's now interior. And our code says in our method, in our manual, we went through this many years ago, says you cover it up and make the building bigger. In other words, if you have a little square and then you put a giant square around it, it's 100%. Okay. In this case, it's only Can the we, blue that is shown. Plus, if you go to A301, you'll see that. I, I think we get the point. Can we get a staff answer to this problem? I mean, if there is an answer, if there's not, this is a new, this is a new structure, not a remodel. The, 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 wall that John is saying becomes an interior wall and so has to be counted appears to be counted on A301. No, it isn't. You'll have to be more precise. I see a red dotted line. And that red line does not cover this area. It, the red dotted line, if you put it up, I'll show, I can show you. It's very it, close to this amount. It's got the... See, it see where this goes all the way back to the garage. That only goes about a third of the way, maybe half, on both floors. And uh, <clears throat> then on top of that, you'll look at, there's other areas, for example, the south side of the second floor, there's some kind of cutouts and some stuff in the front of the building and all the stuff across the front. So. It looks like this is way over 150 or 50, way over. I don't know what the number is because there, there aren't enough, there's no dimensions on these plans. But you see, what I, I hope you understand what I'm talking about. So you're looking at the uh, section of the diagram labeled E first floor, correct? Right. And if you okay. look at okay, okay. And then and you're looking at the little segment along the horizontal line that's labeled 53.9 feet. No, what I'm looking at is you see where it says perimeter 79 feet, demolished three feet. It's a garage. Yeah. Everywhere from that garage to the front of the building has to be counted. Okay. On both floors. Because you're enclosing back to the garage. You're enclosing the interior structure. Right. Okay. And this is not, you know, new stuff. This is always done this way. Um, so I don't know how to deal with it because I can't calculate it, but it looks to me like it's 
takes you way over. I see what you're saying. What, staff, do you see it? Do you have a reaction? Let me let me uh, speak to it. Um, so I'm looking at the plants um, right now for the first time. So I'm trying to I'm trying to figure. Out. I'm I am seeing what. Um, um, what you guys are talking about, but it is not the entire length of the wall all the way to the front of the property, um, but it is a section that I would say it's somewhere around 20 feet. Um, Adrian, if you look at A101, you'll see it goes from the, from the ocean side of the garage all the way to the front of the building. But there's an op open to the sky above. Uh, there is a courtyard in the middle of the garage and the house. I know, but everything else is is new addition. It says now, there is, um, you know, there is a a section in the remodel policy that uh, speaks to this issue, and um, that section is. Uh, C2, and it says exterior walls that become interior walls shall be counted against the 50% threshold unless the exterior wall remains load bearing or as otherwise determined by the planning director for an unusual circumstance. Okay, well, this that is intended, and Jeff and I have been through. You know, this was like a huge deal at the time. Um, that is intended to be when it is the load bearing wall. Okay. This obviously is so big that you have to hold up the, the two story addition with a load bearing wall. Okay. This is, this is in our policy man, in our uh, LIP, whatever that manual is. Uh, and it's two floors. Um, plus, there's other things that you can see on 101, A301, that are added to this. So you just can't take a building and, and wrap it in another building and say it's not demolition. It just can't be done. So it sounds like you're asking for a continuance to have the calculation made explicit. Uh, I, I, either that or, or an admission by staff that it's over 150 because it's impossible to calculate it from this plan. I tried with a magnifying glass. There are not the dimensions there. There's a lot of geometry involved, but that area was definitely not counted. So if it's the commission's will, we can bring it back. And what concerns me here is one, what is on A301, it, it's, I know it says to scale, but it, I don't believe that to be accurate because the space between the courtyard is way too big because essentially what Commissioner Mazza is talking about is if you take out the 20 feet, you got roughly a little over 13 feet, there's about 23 feet of wall that's missing from the calculation is what Commissioner Maz is concerned about. And it, it, if you were to add that 23 feet, it, it kicks our numbers up from 36 to 39%. Uh, but we also need to look- more than 23 feet. Um, well, that wall is specced out, according to their line there at 53.9. 20 and a half feet of that wall remain as is open to the sky that leaves 33 and their red dash line uh, roughly is about 13 feet 33 minus 13 is 20. Uh, but then we have the second floor to look at as well so if it's the commission's will uh, we can request and unfortunately i i don't have our building official with us this evening uh, because this was checked uh, against that policy and what concerns me is there might have been a revision that we didn't see and, and we don't have in front of you this evening, but we would be glad if it's the commission's will, um, <clears throat> we can bring back a, a final version of this um, and also make sure it's what the building officials saw. There is a, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Jessica, but there was, there is a referral in here from the building official 
correct? Yes, there is, including in the stock report. Okay, well, I, I think that's wise. I think if you do look at this happens to be A101 is the second story. And if you look on A301, very little of those walls. There's one section alone that's 19 feet. Uh, it appears to be about another 50 feet that are missing uh, between there and the garage. There's a couple windows that are delineated. Uh, so I think it's a, a significant amount. Um, if, if we're going to vote to bring it back, can I just ask a couple questions? Um, are the palm trees going? Because there was a question about no, I don't believe they're being proposed to be demolished. Well, can can everyone hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So um, let me lower my hand, please. Okay. So uh, what Richard referred to and Jessica and I had looked at is that exception. When it's load bearing, uh, it will not count. Now, the existing wall that Commissioner uh, Mazo is referring to is load bearing for the existing building. We are not adding load to that wall because of where we are adding the square footage in the interior courtyard. That structure has its own structure and going down all the way to its own foundation. So that exterior wall was bearing and remains bearing the same way nothing we added to it and therefore that exception applies I, I i beg to differ with you i was at the hearing jeff was at the hearing we had four meetings on this and wrote a policy manual okay it's it's very well defined um the other and and it was done for walls that were as much as two feet away from the other walls you cannot make an ex interior wall an exterior wall into an interior wall. And if it's if it's but, but but sir, sir, based on this policy, you can if it's but load bearing. I'm afraid you're wrong. I'm gonna let the staff determine that, but I'm afraid you're wrong. There's probably 30 examples of where the planning commission has followed the old policy. If I can clarify, if he's saying that that wall bears load on the existing house, but not on the new segment. Then the new segment would need some load bearing there too, and then you'd end up with sistered walls there. You'd have a sistered wall situation with the old and the new walls right next to each other. No, no, no. The structural can be done in a way that you have columns, and then you can deliver the framing, and you don't have to have a wall right next to the. Yeah, existing. I, I, I would like to keep this to the planning commission. The purpose for the remodel policy was made so you could not take a small structure and surround it with a big structure and say and, ca and not count covering up those walls i mean it's i'll let the I, I think we should let the staff go through and try to find any other house ever in malibu this has ever been done to after that policy was done uh the other question i have That's not, before i make a motion is that uh the geo technical review require the assumption of risk is there an assumption of risk in this in our uh um findings or whatever it is uh because that's it's required because it's on a earthquake fault well, it depends. and it's in the staff it's in the report on the geo uh remodel anyway i'm going to make a motion we continue this item to um a date whatever you want to pick Does any of the staff have a, a recommendation? I'll second that. Uh, maybe staff will have something else to say, though. Yeah, well, I need to make, finish the motion with a date. Yeah, I, I would recommend, commissioners, that we do a date uncertain. And the reason for that is uh, because I want to make certain there's adequate time for us to get, uh, if we have to run these plans uh, back through the building official, I. I don't want to tie her into something without speaking to her about her schedule. Okay, uh, so that's my motion. So, yeah. Director Malika, do you yes. feel that there's something wrong with these plans? You've got an architect that's been walking through your doors for 20 years. 
And I don't think he's not knowing what he's talking about. Do you feel there's an issue here? Uh, as Adrian mentioned, th there is a, a carve out for this in the remodel policy. My ambition is to be able to have the building official who opined on this uh, explain ex explain exactly how that this is consistent with the policy. Uh, she does conduct our reviews. And so I am, I respect Yolanda's decision on this and, you know, uh, her advice on this and determination, as I mentioned, was that they did meet the policy. So if we bring it back, it, what we would be doing is making certain that the, the plans match uh, what it is that she saw and be able to have uh, perhaps even a statement from her that would help the commission in this. Uh, but this was reviewed uh, by the person who looks in. I'm not trying to single her out, but you know, our standard practice is when somebody has a remodel, because we're very aware of folks that try to game the system, uh, that's something we definitely work to make sure that does not happen. And so we, for the purposes of consistency, we work with the building official to ensure that a consistent review can, that is, it is completed. Uh, so we could bring back that evidence if it's the commission's wish. But Director Malika, don't you already have that from her because you've got a set of plans that are ready to go? That is correct. We do. Then why why would why would we have to go back and ask the same question twice? If she's given if if she's given her blessing on it, what are we talking about here? I I, I don't disagree with you, Chair. Uh, it's it, you know once you it's up to the majority of the commission. Yeah, if the majority of the commission is satisfied with the evidence of the record. Uh, that work that that does it. If it's if there's a majority vote that wants more information, uh, I'm more than glad to get it. But you are correct. You have the evidence in the record. There is uh, Jessica. You have the page number handy. Uh, there is the determination from the building official that it was calculated correctly. And does the building official is the building official aware of the policy? Yes, the and the. And the reason why I can say that with certainty is sure. that uh, we've worked, we've, I think, uh, as Commissioner Mazel point out, there was a lot of concern that in the field, things were going beyond 50%. Uh, the way that we've approached that problem was to bring the building official into the process and it looks like Lauren's got her hand up too and, and can weigh in on this because I know she does some of the plan checks. The way that we we addressed the issue of these remodels and rebuilds going awry in the field is to bring the building department into it so that essentially uh, you can almost think of it like a concurrent plan check. And I'm sure the applicant can explain this to you a bit better. But the building department looked at essentially some structural engineering, they, they looked at the plans to, they looked at something a lot more detailed than just black and red lines. Uh, we asked that we want to actually see, is it really possible to build this? And so that's the level of review that happens. And, um, the re and we also um, provided the building department with a copy of our remodel policy, and they've asked us questions about it. And we've worked with them uh, to make sure that they are understanding of it. That's the reason for all of this is I don't want to call that somebody is going beyond 50% in the field. Uh, we've been accused of that multiple times when we find it, uh, because now we have a building official that really has embraced it. She stops the project, and there's one right now where we're telling them they need a CDP. So we've worked heavily on this to really front load it. So why would we do this to this client or to this client to this, these people, this homeowner, this future person wants to live here. And everything you just explained, Yolanda does to a T. So we're talking about because two of the commissioners that aren't, don't frame and haven't done this kind of work, maybe one of them has somewhat. And then all of a sudden, you're thinking that we're way over on the, on the square footage on the remodel, and we're not, and you got up to what, 39%, we're still you know, 10% less than we than we need to be. And you've already got building safety that gave you the the okay to do this. There I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't do, hang on, Vice Chair. 
the, you've got what you wanted. You, these people, you, you, this is an architect that's come through your doors for 20 years. This isn't some guy from out of town, Oregon or, or Milan, Italy, that just got into town to try and figure our plan out. I hate when this happens and it's not fair to these people. You've got, you did everything you were supposed to do to get this thing to this point and it should go all the way through. Okay, well, there's something to do with, uh, I would like to, Yolanda to come back with a single example, one in the whole history of Malibu, since we set the remodel policy in 2002, where we've allowed interior walls not to be, to be, be exterior walls become interior walls and uh, not be counted. Just one example, because this, Jeff and I went through many hearings on this. It's been used many times, and it, I can think of no no time ever a single interior wall was done that way. Not once. All we right, let's do this. Life. Commissioner Jennings, do you have a thought? Well, looking at it, I, I think that um, the answer may be on A30, uh, I'm sorry, on three, A302, because it looks like the reason that the demolish wall stops is because the remainder of the, of the wall is still there. It's just open to the second floor and the second floor is, uh, it's a sort of an atrium situation there. And to tell you the truth, John, uh, I, I do remember uh, the whole process that we went through the whole process that we went through was in a lot of ways a compromise situation between um, trying to figure out what works and how many angels can dance on the head of a pen and that's how you got into this whole business about well if you raise the the, the, the plates is that a difference is if, if your sister uh, studs in is that you know is that going to make a difference it was extremely detailed, but it was arbitrary. And the arbitrariness, um, I don't keep all the details of it in my mind. So I guess what I come down uh, is to say I would like to have, I'm sure that Yolanda can explain why she approved it. And I just want to hear the rational explanation for uh, why she did and how it relates to the, uh, um, to the policy. And, um, and I'm sorry to, that, that, that this will put off the project for a little time, but, but uh, I, I think that that's worth having it looked at. Commissioner Wetton, you're muted. Uh, I mean, I agree. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's unclear. And I think, I think Yolanda could clear it up. And I, you know, I, I agree. I hate to have it delayed, but you know, I mean, I think we've got some controversy over how how it was calculated, and I, you know, I, I see I see their point. Okay. After yeah. it's almost almost eleven, can we call the question? I guess we have to. Commissioner Mazza. Yes. Commissioner Hill. Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Whitten? Yes. Chair Smith? No. Motion carries. Okay, I move we adjourn. Second. A second. I'm sorry, I'm just noting it the time for a second. Time for six. Um, Commissioner Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Um, Commissioner Wetton? Yes. Chair Smith? Yep. Motion carries. You are adjourned. Good night.
allow the trespass to be 25 feet from the property line instead of the edge of the paved road. Uh, staff also recommends that the trespass only be allowed to service station, uh, which is consistent with the Planning Commission recommendation. And uh, the consultant also suggests that we should add measurement, a measurement section uh, so that the trespass measurements are done consistently and with the correct tools. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the actual proposed language by staff. I'm just going to summarize. The current text is in black and, and the new text is shown in red. Um, language is proposed to be added to subsections one and two, requiring that the trespass requirements be met at any plane and 